once again welcome all our participants to day two of our webinar on basic principles in Christian marriage counseling. My name is Dr. Mininim Oseji, and I am the national president of the Medical Women's Association of Nigeria. This marriage counseling webinar is aimed at building the capacity of Christian health workers and other interested persons in marriage counseling, as well as responsible parenting. Last week, we had our facilitators take us on the fear of God, love for each other, communication, and sex life. For those who were present, there were so many practical lessons to learn for our individual lives, as well as for us to help other couples. Today, we are going to have four topics, extended family relationships, spiritual life together, financial oneness, and children in the family. It is hoped that at the end of the webinar, we would have trained persons who would volunteer to offer free counseling to couples experiencing marital disharmony. Now, our facilitators are, we have Deaconess Lizzie Nkem Oyema. She was born in her hometown, Ukwaba, village in Usukwa clan of Aniocha South Local Government Area of Delta State. She's the seventh child of eight children. She finished her primary and secondary school in her hometown, after which she attended Federal College of Education at Sabah, where she obtained an NC certificate in business education. She then proceeded to the University of Nigeria, Usuka, where she bagged her first and second degree certificates in business education. She is currently rounding off her PhD in Ebo in State University. She is married with three biological children, two grandchildren, and many other adopted children. She is a senior lecturer at the Federal College of Education Technical Asaba, Delta State, a matron to the Youth Fellowship of Church of God Mission Asaba, and Young Achievers Association in Delta State. She is a seasoned marriage counselor, a teacher of the Word of God, and a tested and trusted life coach. She has written so many books and journals for both educational and motivational reasons. She loves traveling, public speaking, reading, and praying, as she believes that without God, she is nothing. Charles Chie Ikeju no Okoba, <laughs> our other facilitator, I call him Elder Okoba, holds three university degrees, a bachelor's degree in theater arts from the University of Nigeria, sorry, University of Calabar, Nigeria, a bachelor's degree in law from the University of Benin, Nigeria, and a bachelor's degree and a, and a master's degree in law from Ambrose Ali University, Ekoma, Nigeria. He worked in the Judiciary High Court of Justice of the defunct Bendel State as a court administrator in various capacities, such as establishment training, labor relations, protocol, etc. He continued his working career in the Judiciary High Court for Justice of Delta State upon the creation of the state in 1991, and he ended his working career as a director. He holds two fellowship awards in administration and management, one from the Chartered Institute of Corporate Administration, FICA, and the other from Academy of Management Science, FMSC. He held the post of Director of Administration and Personnel Management of the High Court of Delta State from 1999 to 2009 and retired from the Judiciary Service of Delta State in 2012 as a director after 35 years of meritorious service. Shin Yokoba made so much input and impact in the Judiciary of Delta State that after his retirement, he was called back to serve as one of the two pioneer directors of the Delta State multi dorm courthouse from 2015 to 2017. He has written and published many books, two of which remain the working guide to the support staff of the judicial service all over Nigeria, especially in Delta State. Some of his other books are on marriage counseling and family life, an area in which he has exercised himself passionately and appreciably <clears throat> over the years. He's a proficient mediator, counselor, and minister of the gospel. He's, a, he's an experienced teacher of the Holy Bible. He has written and published many novels, fictions, which have been used for serious academic work in Nigeria. 
especially in Edo and Delta states of Nigeria, which have enjoyed wide leadership and appreciation in many parts of the world, including Chicago University, whereupon his novel, Aura of Divinity, caught the curious attention of Wendy Griswold, or a professor of sociology of literature and culture, United States of America. Chin Okoba is currently serving as a facilitator and project supervisor at the National Open University of Nigeria at Sabaswati Center under the Faculty of Law. At the same time, he's exercising his skill as a private alternative dispute resolution practitioner. He's serving as a neutral in the ADR at Edo State's multi door courthouse Benin City. He's certified in various aspects of ADR, negotiator of Queensland University of Australia, arbitrator of Chartered Institute of Arbitration of United Kingdom, and mediator of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators. Chinye is also engaged in private law practice as the principal partner of Mount Fidel's law consult. He's married with children. Having introduced our facilitators, I would like to specially call upon our national president-elect, Dr. Adekemi Otolori, to give us an opening prayer for us to start today's webinar. Dr. Otolori, please, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Good afternoon, my president and the house. Thank you for this opportunity. Let us pray, please. In Jesus' name, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your ministry of marriage. You put marriage into place to give us a good life. You said it is not good for man to be alone, but to be assisted by a good helpmeet. Thank you for the men and women you have put in place to teach us how to have a good Christian married life and to be good role models to counsel other women. Father Lord, we thank you for our president for the initiation of this workshop. We thank you for what we learned last week and we thank you for retentive memory and ability to be doers. Lord, as we go into today's session, speak through our teachers. May we have attentive ears. May we have a ready mind and may we be ready to impart others. Thank you, Lord, for we hope to praise you more at the end of it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So over to our facilitators. We have the first lecture is supposed to be extended family relationships. This one will be very interesting. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Put on your Good camera and let's see your face. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Good evening. Yeah. I, I thank God for keeping us to witness this day. We can hear you, but we can see you. Wow. OK. Let me adjust. Yeah, my name is Sonia Malizi, okay, as rightly introduced. Last week, we, we had it very interesting. Today is another interesting day. God will see us through. I'm here to talk on extended family. Before I go into that, I have something to run over for the benefit of those who are not present, just to, sum, to summarize all that we have done. For, for us to sustain intimacy in marriage, always love your spouse, believe in each other, Celebrate each other often. Come on. Don't argue. Don't argue with each other. You will not help. Are you with me? Please, can we mute our phones? Can we mute our devices? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Go ahead. Express sense imperfection from each other. Fix solutions to problems on time. Go for a walk together once a week. Hold each other's hand often. Ignite the passion in your spouse daily. Always appreciate him. Just laugh over issues with uh, what exercising. Kill the spirit of unhealthy competition. Let your spouse know your movement. Especially this time of uh, crisis here and there. Make, move, make love like 
newly wedded, as if you are fresh, every day should be new. If you approach and uh, seek your husband every day, no separate, separate rooms as rightly discussed last night, both of you should be in, be in one room. Oppose any, it, any intruder or third party. Do not give ear to gossip or anybody that wants to disorganize your marriage. Oppose them always. Then, after that, none of them will come. Pray together always. Quality time should be spent together so that it gets meted with each other. Resist every temptation of, of unfaithfulness, going outside to cheat. Stay positive to each other's vision, always risen together. Take no record of past offense. Let bygone be bygone always. Utilize every opportunity to be born, to be very close, and visualize a glorious future together. Win each other's admir uh, admiration, whatever you like. Always, always admire the person appreciates. Be transparent to one another. Do not shout on each other for any reason, no occasion. Any, anytime you are provoked, the best thing is to keep quiet so that you won't speak in anger. After some time, you take prayer to cover it. With this, you'll be able to handle the situation of extended family. If you, have, if you put all this in practice, it, it will be bring two of you together. The spa will be in one. With that, you'll be able to handle the situation of extended families, which I will be talking on this evening. What is the extended family? Before you talk of extended family, there's an a nucleus family, immediate family, which is made up of the man, the woman, and their children. Outside this, you have the, what is called extended family. To so independent, the man and the woman who are newly married will join to form the nuclear family, leaving their parents, leaving their parents continue. That is nuclear family. Then you need to, yeah, and this is, and we are being guided by Gen Genesis chapter two, verse 24, which says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. They both become one flesh. Automatically you are one. Are you with me? Hello? Hello? We are muted, so we cannot always answer on time, but we are hearing you. All right, fine. All right. Then therefore shall a man leave his father and, and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they both become one flesh. That is marriage. Is marriage mathematics one plus one equals to one. So it is important for you to unite and become independent, not to depend on any of your parents, not to depend on any of your friends, but both of you live an independent eh, life, depending on one another. Honor that father and their mother, which is the first commandment with, eh, with, with promise. That is about children. When you are talking about children, you have to obey them. When you are married, you will still honor your parents, but you shall not take directives from them on how to run your family. As you are no more directly under them, just as I already said, that is gotten in, in efficiencies by two. Do not carry your problem to your families. There was an issue we settled of recent, a woman who died and he told the family that he built the house. After that, there was an issue, but that is by the way. So do not discuss your, your family issues with your parents. So you depend on your family. That, that does not mean we disobey your family. On that note, no married couples should indulge in carrying their misunderstanding or quarry to their parents, relations or friends for settlement. Only settle within yourself. The person in between two of you is God, just as I said in the last lecture. God is there in your midst. Therefore, go to God in prayer. He will settle the differences. They may be asking for unnecessary advice and series of advice, actions and uh, reactions that will uh, not give uh, stability to their marriage. At the moment you go to, go to your relations and begin to seek opinion of people, suffering opinion of how they're managing, you will, they will mislead you. So we will give you such information that will not even uh, go away. Better be yourself, be yourself. And how does this help in the ministry? In Proverbs uh, chapter 11, 24, he said, there is that uh, scattered, yet increases. There is that which uh, are hoarded more than it is met, but it is tended to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat. He that watereth shall be watered also himself. The key to the prosperity of many 
couple is getting it when it, you scatter that you can uh, gather. Anytime you, you, you get things, you know, scatter the things that are not okay, you two can come together and put things together and it will flow well. Couples should learn to give, give and uh, God will uh, always multiply when, whatever they give. And uh, from time to time, have passion for giving. He that giveth never lack for your family to progress. Cultivate the habit of giving, giving to one or another, giving to others, even the ministry. Give to the ministry for the growth of the ministry. No ministry runs without finance, but you have to do that with the concept of each other. Do not do it individually. Do not do it individually, which may not go well. Do not go behind to go and favor pastor without the concept of your husband. Two of you must work together. Do not go and give to your family without the concept of your husband. Whatever you are doing, let your husband know. Whatever the man doing, let the man know. Let the man know. Hello? Are you with me? Our devices, please. Yes, are we are with you. you. Yeah. Okay. When you are married, Fulfill your responsibility towards your parents to, to the best of your ability. When you are married, make sure you fulfill your responsibility. You are your duty bound to take care of your home, your children, before your extended families. Yes, extended family will come in, but with one accord, you will handle the situation, give them attention when they come. And when they are going, release them without uh, grudges or any difference. Both of you should work together to maintain your relationship. Some, some women, they work on their own relations, relations more to the family than the men. When the man's relation comes in, it becomes an issue, which is not the right thing to do. Both families are now your family because you are one. Your woman's family is the man's family. The man's family is the woman's family. By so doing, their relations are now your relations. So you show love equally to them. Do not discriminate that this is my my sister, this is my husband's relation. Even though some husband relations comes in to cause this, uh, uh, the evil or uh, cause confusion in the marriage, you need to overlook it with prayer as a virtuous woman. And as a man, too, you, have, you have to overlook it. Go inside the room, discuss with your wife, and come out with a decision that will keep the family going. But both family must be carried along. Do not drop in. Parents give birth to the woman so that the woman will be able to help them in their future. They also, so also, parents give uh, bed to the man and train the man as well in order to be useful to them. Do not seize everything from the man, from the, uh, not to get to the family, nor you, the man, seizing everything from the woman's family. Both of you should be able to meet together and carry both families. Equal. The extended family's problem should be solved together with you, not individually. Do not go privately in order to uh, please your family and, and displease their home. There's one thing I keep telling people, before extended family, take good care of your children. Because when uh, your husband is no more, no relations around, nobody will care. And also when the, man, the woman is not around, no relation will care. Therefore, when both of you are alive, make much input on your children. Give them solidified training so that if nature, a call of nature comes, you will be able to stand. But that does not mean that you will not take care of your extended relations with wisdom. Who are the extended relations? Your father-in-law, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and also all whatnot. Keep them at risk. Welcome them with love. Do not discriminate. Do not say this is wish and this is wizard. No. As a Christian woman, you ought not to uh, segregate. You're supposed to unite everywhere. And anywhere you appear in your husband's family, let there be peace. If there were disunity in your family, in your husband's family, when you come in, be the peace that have come to unite them. If there were disunity in your wife's family, be the, the peace that have come to unite them. That is the light that you are. Because every Christian is light. Light is Christ. And we are Christ, so light is in us. So when light comes, darkness will disappear. This unity quarry and here and there is all about darkness. But you coming with love and peace, light has appeared. Then every difference will disappear. Love will come to kindle. That is very, very paramount for every Christian to hold. Husband and wife should look for opportunities to help others. Each Christians, each especially Christians, because it, it is in giving that you receive. After discussing about your extended family, you still have children. Those who call it daddy, daddy, or mommy, mommy in the church, you take care of them if you have enough. Yeah, you render help to those who need help in the church, help in the church project. 
discuss together before you. You can even if you have enough, you can join your hand with your husband to train anyone that is from a very less privileged home. Then help them to train them to a standard. Be mommy indeed and care for them. So take care of your pastor, but don't do that alone. You do it with her. So I've said that before. That was getting the book of Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. Galatians 6, verse 9 to 10. That one, when you read it, you will see it. It is there. It is important for us to praise thy Lord. Praise thy Lord. Hello? 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 Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. 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 Don't be tired of helping others, physically, mentally, and uh, spiritually. Beside the less privileged ones. It is important to hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? 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 I hear you, hear you, but we can't keep answering because we are. Um... Hello? Okay. If you are hearing me, I was, I made mention of Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. See, when you, when you give with joy, you reap with joy. So try to give as a family. Do not be a selfish uh, couple. Try to, and when you give, you see, you see freshness coming to your home. You see joy coming into your home because blessings of God will, uh, uh, will always overflow in your home. Don't be tired of helping each other, uh, helping others, physically, materially, and spiritually, especially the less privileged ones. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, which says, be you brethren, be not weary in where doing. Try to give. Give with joy. Give with all with all your heart, but do it with wisdom that will not uh, affect your family, to help you a lot. A couple should let to be hospitable, hospitable, exercising wisdom and the level headedness in doing this as much as possible. Help should be given to both sides of the extended family. Just as I've said before, help should be given to both sides of the extended family by mutual consent, by mutual understanding, with an agreement with one accord. Then you can render help. You can pick any of your siblings and train with the agreement of your, uh, with your spouse. And do not welcome your, your relations without informing your husband that your sister or your brother, before they call, they must have called you. Inform your husband that your sister or your brother has called that is coming. You both will agree and will expect such visitor. Do not allow your, your relation to come to the family without notifying each other. Such may bring uh, misunderstanding. So you avoid it. When they are coming, then let them know that your relation is coming and define the duration they are going to stay. If it's done that want to live with you, let it be in agreement with each other. That will make family to, to flow without any uh, uh, argument or misunderstanding. Male or female, house help. When I talk, talk about help, house help this time is among those that may be, may be found in your home. A wife should not create a situation in which the husband can be enticed by a female house help by denying himself, denying him sexual rights. In the same way, the husband shouldn't, should not create a situation in which the wife can be enticed by the male house help. It is, 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 is occurring, but it, should, it shouldn't be head of Christian homes. Do not create a vacuum for your house head to be very close to your husband, because such may be tempting. Do not starve your husband of sexual practices, because he may go, he, he, no, when there's in the absence of nothing, say when, when um, desirable is not available, availability becomes disability. So when it is not available, the, the nearby person may take us, the same thing woman. So be, be sexual discipline in any way because it's not all the time your wife will be there. But if your husband is there, your wife is there, you, you do the need for. Just as I told them today when we were having women's program, that sex is important for marriage. It brings unity. It brings understanding. It brings, you know, anywhere you are going, you are feeling the, the presence of your husband and the presence of your wife in you as you are moving. Even come phone call, calling your husband from time to time for those whose husband has stayed in another station. You make phone calls from time to time. 
that by to know everywhere, anywhere he is and what he has eaten, where he's going to. So also your husband will be calling you. That, therefore, your presence is forever and constantly fed in him or her. It will help a lot. The house help should not make the couple bed, the couple's bed, and they should not cook and serve food without the supervision of the wife. The house help should not play the role of the wife. You should not take your own duty. You should not usurp your position in the house. That you have house help does not mean that your house help should be doing, going to her bedroom to make beds, wash her husband's undies, do this for your husband. No. There's a scripture that said that it is more, it's, a woman is blessed by washing the husband's clothes. And that has been the practice of the old. A woman received blessing by keeping the husband's clothes neat. And so also the husband helps the wife to keep themselves neat. Do not carry everything to herself. By creating, making her house help to play a role, you are creating room, creating a vacuum for relationship between your husband and your herself. So also the man, not coming closer to your wife, no playing with your wife, giving him talks from time to time, you're creating room for him to have close discussion with the male house help, which is very tempting. Try to avoid it, it's very, very tempting. In all circumstances, the man and the woman should maintain their integrity before the house help. Do, mind the kind of joke a crack before the house help. We are talking to the house help, know how you carry yourself, how you package yourself, try to have value to yourself, not to come so low, to the house help, discussing things that you ought not to discuss. Maybe I affair that concerns you and your husband, you bring it down to your house help. Do you see what uh, uh, my husband is, 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 is? It's uncalled for. It is very much uncalled for. You do not do that. But so then you are, you are, you are devaluing your marriage, reducing your husband as well, reducing yourself before the house help. By the time the house help will, the house help will turn against you, you will ask him what happened, whereas you are the genesis of the whole issue. These measures should also apply to the grown-up eh, children of the couple. The same thing applies to your children when they are grown. Do not make a sex advancement before your children and your house help. Try to add, you know, maintain integrity before them. Do not go and begin to make a, a foreplay before your children or this. No, when, they are, when you're alone, you can do that. Do not expose your love before your children, nor your lasses before your children. Work on yourself privately. Don't run down your spouse before the extended family, but treat him or her with in confidence. Some of us women are most hard, or some women are the breadwinner of the home, and maybe the husband's job has stopped, or the, it's not, the income is not coming well through the man. You don't go home to discuss with your family, or the man's going to discuss with his own family. I bought this, I bought this car, let me go and tell my people I bought. No, it ought not to be. Everything should be in, embedded inside your love. Do not go and discuss your affairs with your family. By the time you go out to discuss your affairs with the family, it becomes an issue. There was a couple I was counseling. Every little thing, the man will go to the, the sisters. They have sisters in Asaba here. After discussing, he will go back. The sisters will be angry with the wife, angry with every time, every little misunderstanding. He will run to the sisters. One day I invited the wife came and discussed with me. I invited the man to my house. When he came, I told him, Mr. Man, you've gone to report your wife to your sisters, but now you have reconciled, you are in love. Do you know that those reports you have made to your sisters, your siblings, remain in them, and the hatred remains in them. They will never love your wife as you will do. They will never forgive, but you are forgiven already. Why not keep this uh, trial that comes at the moment, after some time, to visit you away? Why going to uh, discuss it to your family? And this man went back and practiced it before he left, though he may so rest in peace, before the man died. They were living in peace, no longer going to discuss with the family and family advising him on how to, how to handle his home. As a man, before you get married, you're already mature to control your home. No need of going to seek advice from your parents. You are no longer of that family. You are, you are built your own family, you're on your own, you stand firmly and build up your home and be a man. So as a woman, live, you no. Know, independent of each other, you and your husband, and live dependently in your marriage. Do not go and discuss with your family. That, you know, I collected a loan to buy, uh, to buy that land with my husband. The loan I collected, I bought it. I'm paying for the loan. You know, I don't have money to give you people because they're deducting the money. No, in, in near future, you are, the husband, the, your family will use it to fight against either the man or the woman that property belongs to them because their daughter bought it. We have experienced it recently. Please let it not be found among Christian married homes. It's an error. Don't run down, do not 
that discuss her husband, even if he's not performing well on the bed, do not go and tell them that my husband is not satisfying me on bed. My husband is this. If your husband has order that is offensive to you, you have to clean him up. Some men, they are, they, they, they ooze are lots. Where after uh, works, the sweat will even uh, magnify it, it begins to smell here and there. Do you know, it's their property, it's their cross. Call them and clean him up. Make him to be neat. Most often, you when know, he uh, undresses, put the material into the bucket, wet it. He will not wear the following day because some men are stubborn. They would like to wear what they wore the previous day. So you, you, are, you want to clean up your husband. Why the man is in position to clean up the man, the woman? Make your wife to your taste. You saw how she was before she came. Now make her to remain in that form by assisting her in everything. Ma marriage is building, making one another to be happy. That is all about marriage, not manage. It's enjoyable. It depends on how you make it. But if your wife is the type that oozes you, you help your wife to clean up. Buy good stuff to clean up the woman, and the woman will need and uh, attractive to you to have to nail her every point in time. But so doing, your marriage will be smooth. If your husband is in the office and you are in your office, call your husband from time to time so that you, you, the presence of each other will set among yourselves. And this will help you to have a successful marriage in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. That is the end of the discussion for extended families. I had that sometimes I nearly forgot about a, a mother's coming to do a mobile, or that is a babysitting. It helps. There's another issue there we need to discuss of. That extended family. Your mother come to do babysitting in your, in your house. Do not allow your mother to be in between you and your husband because he's doing babysitting. Or your mother-in-law come to do babysitting. Allow them to play their own role and stay briefly and go back to your husband. Do not stay there to be dictating for them as mother-in-law to the man or to the woman. It will help them to run the family successfully without any disunity in the home. And as well, carry the extended family where when the mother-in-law will be going, you are in, a, in a one accord, you agree on what to use to say farewell to their mother-in-law. And that will help them to understand when they get home, they say, yeah, the family is there for me, they will, and they're living peacefully. Thank you, and God bless you. Amen, thank you, Ma. Yeah. Thank you, our deaconess, for that very exciting presentation on the extended family relationship. This is something we really need to look into. It has been the cause of a lot of conflict in the home. Uh, please, if you have questions, prefer if you put your questions in the chat. Is anybody that has a question? Okay. The next topic is the spiritual life together. And that is going to be taken by Elder. No, 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 no. No, no it's it's on your Malizi. It's on your Malizi. Hello. It's on your Malizi. All right. Deaconess. Okay, Deaconess. On your Malizi will take the spiritual life together. So yes. please, subsequently, if you have any questions. Kindly put your questions as a chat so that once the presentation is over, we go on to the questions. So please go ahead with the second Praise lecture. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. We are Amen. going to live our life together as husband and wife. Before you talk of spiritual life, you have to, as a person, check yourself. Are you really in the Lord? Do you have Christ in you? Because he can't give what you don't have. Spiritual life, make, making yourself to be a potential of Christ, Christ-like. How is your Christ like in you? How do, how do you relate with Christ? Do you speak with Christ? Do you talk as Christ? Do you reason with Christ? And if you are, you can work together and make each other to grow. Some persons may be weak, your husband may be weak, you know, uh, in spiritually, in spiritual life, but you that is strong, we make your husband to come up. They say, iron sharpness iron. How do you do this? By coming together, praying together, studying the word of God together. It will help you to grow 
your spiritual life. And do not, you see, where there's trouble, you can never grow spiritually. But with peace, you can grow spiritually, study, and, and they recognize the presence of God in your marriage. How do you recognize the presence of God in your marriage? Do not practice anything evil. Make sure that your husband understands you very well that as a woman of God, you cannot do this. And also you understand your husband that as a woman, of, as a man of God, you cannot do this. By so doing, you can grow together. Studying the word every day, you come together to study the word. By studying the word, you are growing. They say that the entrance of the word makes us understand it to the simple. So by the time that is uh, Psalm 119, verse um, 25, there about. And they say, when you have the word of God in you, that is in Psalm 192, verse 10, say that his word have I hidden in my mind that I will not sin against anybody. So if you have the word of God in your mind, you will grow well. You cannot go contrary to the will of God. You cannot go contrary to your husband too, because your husband is God, you are seeing. God, your husband is the coverage of the home. Then while your husband is the pastor, you are the uh, uh, resident pastor or assistant pastor, the way I can classify it. So you have to grow by studying the word and doing the will of God every point in time. A couple can, in one accord, exercise limitless authority through faith. You can come together, having one faith, say this thing is what you are lacking in this, in this marriage. But let's pray and believe God that God will do it. And by the way you pray and believe, having faith that that will come to happen, it will come to reality to happen. If it didn't come when expected, behold, behold, it will come when the Lord is ready. They said denial is not, delay is not denial. At the time appointed time, it will come, but just believe that you have prayed, God will make it happen. Have faith in God together to achieve whatever you want to achieve. Against the works of darkness, do not allow any darkness, any trouble to come into your marriage. Have faith so that any dryer coming, you'll be able to withstand it. Sickness can come into the marriage because you don't have faith in one another. You are not spiritually grounded. What you need to do, you begin to complain. It's one of the challenges in the in marriage. You have overcome it and think of how to come out of the, the trial you are facing. It will come out of it. But do not faint when you are passing trial. Come together strongly to be able to overcome this temptation or the works of the darkness. You establish a relationship that should make you to grow, whether sun or rain, you remain you no know, firm in the Lord. Always seek the mind of God before you take any decision. After seeking the mind of God as husband and wife, then God will, will breathe on it. How will you know that God has already breathed on it? You have to have a, a free mind. You have you no know, conviction inside of you that this thing has been done by God. There you go. Always trust in what God can do. A married couple should study the word of God and meditate on it day and night, for there is Therein lies power, authority, and peace. That is written in Joshua 1, verse 8. It said, you study, study the word of God day in and day out. Because in it, there is power, there is blessing, there is a lot. Whatever you need to get in this world, whatever life you want to live, whatever thing you want to enjoy in this world is in the word of God. Every situation you want to provide solution, they are all in the word of God. Take time to go to the word of God. Study it together, you provide solution to such uh, situation. And by so doing, authority and peace will be will, will be given to you to overcome every trials. I've experienced where one is in trial. You see the person smiling. In a different situation, the person will be smiling, smiling. Why is he happy when he's having such problem? Because God is in charge. Because he have faith in God. The man will not complain, the woman will not complain. Whether the trial is from the man's side or from the woman, you because they have faith, you overcome it. Couple, the peace will be raining. Why we are still in facing trials? A couple should separate them. A couple should separate themselves from the ungodly. Yes, some women after marriage, uh, getting married, they are still keeping your, your friends, your single guest friends. They have nothing to give to you. I advise you to join women folks, women's fellowship. It will help you to grow spiritually. You hear the counseling, but do not discuss your marital issues even in that woman folks. Because not all that greeters, they are not good. Better focus on yourself and grow with spiritual life. Isn't it men? You are married and moving with a single men outside bachelors. No, you, you see, you are, evil will be enticing you. Say, tell me who is your friend, then I'll tell you whom you are. Evil communication, they say, corrupt the good manners. Do not make friends with ungodly. 
do not be equally yoked with each or with uh, the, 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 the ungodly, with unbelievers. Be a Christian that focus on the salvation alone and do not diversify your faith. It will help you a lot. Do not be equally yoked with the uh, unbelievers. It, it, it helps you to grow. A couple should exercise wisdom and a level headedness. Oh, sorry, sorry. A couple should love the law of the Lord and uh, meditate on it day and night, putting everything to practice as well. Just as I've rightly said, you should always put everything you study into practice. What is disturbing us in Christendom now that is, even, that is hitting the nation is that we, we, we have many believers. We have many Christians, Christian, Christians, born again Christians, but we don't believe in the word of God. One is to be born again. Another one is to, be, to believe in what you are born into. We are born into Christ, bought and brought, brought up. Then what you need to do is to study who Christ is and become Christ. Practice what you are studying. Practice what you have studied and practice what you have heard. We we'll go to church every day. They will come preach the re, the, the, the real salvation message. We we'll say, oh, this man of God today is wonderful, wonderful. After we pass the gate of the church, we we'll go back to our old style. It's, it's an error. Always put in practice that which you have uh, studied. It will help you a lot, a lot to grow in your spiritual life. Make Christian brethren your friends. If you are in school or anywhere you are, make them your friends so that the communication will be flowing well. You will reason in line with the word of God. No one will utter your, your belief, neither argue your belief. It will help you a lot to grow. That, is what, that was why I said that iron, sharpness iron. You will discuss the Bible, discuss it and understand it and live the life of Christ. It will help you in your, your spiritual life. And if you, if you are built into the word of God, when trial comes, you don't see it at all as trial. You don't see it as problem. You see it as elevation. Because after trial, there was promotion. You see, you see so do not be wary in this because thereafter you will do what? You will reap of it. Be patient because all can be resolved. Uh, carry a problem to another person because they are facing trials. It's an error. Better, better discuss it with brethren if there's need. If it's Christian affairs, it will help you to grow spiritually. And also, also, a couple should love the, the couple as a couple. You should take the word of the Lord as a guide and uh, the reduce onto your life. Make it to be part of you. In Bible, it imply the word of God, emulate it into your system, be the word. You see, that was what I said before in Psalm 119, verse 10. Say, The word have I hid it in my heart that I may not go against the word of God, that I may not sin against God. When you are when you have studied the word, you will no longer think of evil. You the things of this world will no longer entice you because you know where you are going to. So when you study as a couple, both of you should grow, like just as. It is written in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It said, there is no therefore condemnation for them that they are in Christ, who do not live after flesh, but live according to the Spirit of God. Do you understand? By the time you are doing this, you and your husband grow together, reason together. Anytime issue comes, when your husband wants to do it, say, ah, honey, what do you think is the man of God in this situation? Let's reason. God said, my thought was you. It's not of evil but of good, to give you hope and expected end. By so doing, the, the trial will, will go away, seeing that you don't even see it as a couple, that is a trial, but you see it as elevation, it will go. Like our brother Job is an example. So but the Job own was that the wife even left him. That is a, an ugly example, but Job remained in faith. So couple should remain in faith, so that at the end, you shall eat of it. Praise thy Lord. Praise thy Lord. The unity uh, of the unity of yeah. the spiritual according and the according and in the spiritual accord and the, their harmony is never broken. Unity of a couple, the, the synergy of a couple is in spiritual life. When you are we are being granted in synergy, in unity, just as it is written in Psalm 133, what it takes to gather together, peace will reign, progress will be found in that home. 
because there's and the children will grow well because they emulate good things. Children learn by seeing what they're doing. So they see you, they see how mommy and daddy moves. Then they will learn. If you call them in things of God, they will they will be anxious. They will they will study. They would mm -hmm. not think of doing evil because they have seen the life your husband and wife they are living, the life their parents are living. They would like to emulate it. Yeah. If if a couple obeys the word of God in first fruits, tithes and the uh, offering, their their protection and their provision will be all round and perfectly granted as God has promised. Paying of tithes. Say so if you pay your tithe, I will rebook the devourer in your life. It's a condition. This is all this is with condition, with promise. And you decide not to pay your tithe. As a husband and wife, husband should know how much the wife is earning, and also my wife should know how much the husband is earning. They should agree and pay the, their tithe together. So as you pay your tithe, your husband pay your tithe, you have to be refreshing. God will always be there to rebook every devourer that will come into your home. Every trial, it will, the touch will speak for you. It's a command from God. And also, first fruits. Um, honey, this first fruits, the first salary of the year, let us give it out. Some people may find it difficult. It's, no, beginning of the year, it's time to let's spend it. No. What if first and the first month, we are not paying salary? Won't you survive? You will survive. So even in absence of that salary, you will still survive. We workers take it. Is it more salary that is keeping you? No, salary is being spent even that day that salary just, your, your light comes in. But God keep providing. He's our provider. He's our resource. He's our source. It never ceases. So that first fruit is paramount. Bring it out and give. And such, uh, such seed will begin to speak for you on the behalf of the family, the children, anywhere they go. That fruit will continue to speak for you because you have obeyed the, the commandment of God. Offering. Give rich offering. Give offering every time. Just as Catholic do, they give communion here and there. So also you give offering. Do not appear before God empty handed. In Proverbs chapter three, verse nine to 10. Who says, let's go to Bible. Proverbs three, nine to 10. Book of Proverbs chapter three, nine to 10 says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the, the first fruits of all thy increase. Verse 7 says, so shall thy bands be filled with plenty, and the, and the press shall burst out of out with new wine. You have enough. By the time you give that first fruit, you will see even sickness will be far away from you that year. Lack will be far away. Many things, you, you, know, you will grow in abundance. You will have it in sufficiency because you have obeyed God and give us the, just like uh, Abraham did, time taking Isaac, the only child, for sacrifice. Is that not a great, a great honor, a great sacrifice? Great seed paid, but at the end, God recorded it. Praise the Lord. It is important to do that. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10 to 11 also says something about, about uh, Malachi, sorry. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 11 says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now here with for the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the, uh, the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That is the word of God for you. Verse 11 says, and I will rebook the devourer. I will rebook the devourer for your sake. And be not and uh, not destroyed the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your, your, your wine cast the fruit before the time. The field set, in the field, said the Lord of hosts. So when you, when, you pay, when you pay your tithe, give your offering, all these things will be taken care of. In those days, unbelievers, they go to give sacrifice to deities, do all those things, beginning of the years. They will, uh, yeah, they will go and pay some homage, make sacrifice to I want three, just to covenant with the three for the year to make sure that the three protect them. That is foolishness. Three that is planted by, by God. A man even has to plant it, but you no know, seed. Grow up, it becomes your God to serve it. It's an error. By, by take care of God, you are, you are living God, you are serving a living God, pay, sacri make sacrifice to God. 
serving as if you are, you are a fool, serving as if you are the only child of God, that others are, when others are disobeying, remain faithful to God. You will see the benefit of it. I am a living testimony. By the time you follow God in totality, submitting yourself without bringing your own personal wisdom. Say, I want to reason. All these things they are doing is fictitious. No. It's a, it's a play, yes. Follow the word of God just as it is. Practice it. If you go to church, a man of God comes to preach in something that is contrary to the word of God, and you are not spiritually balanced, you will be misled. You will be what? Misled. That's why that the Bible is made for both poor and the rich. So that nobody can mislead you. Study the word of God and know it very well. Know the one to apply in every situation. Because every stage, the station has its own portion of Bible, scripture backup to fight it out. So when you are doing all these things, you know you, 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 you will be sound spiritually. You will be sound physically. You will be sound mentally. And financially equally, you, you will be sound. Our children, we, you never cast our children young. God will protect them. God will shed them out of evil. It is important to obey this titan. It's very important. Titan, offering, and the uh, and, uh, first fruit is very, very important. Protection is assured. Their protection and provision will be all around and perfectly granted as God has promised. He must promise. When God promises a thing, he must do it. So do your own part and watch God do his own part. Do not reason. Say, let us reason. This thing uh, would I say, is it right or not? No. Play along with God and see God in action. It will be very, it will be well with you and your family. A couple should practice unity of faith in prayers. Whatever they ask shall be granted through Christ. And we have said before, but we let us revisit this. Unity of faith. Let us sow seed. You see this program that is coming, where we are going to pay sow seeds of social amount. And we will believe that after paying this seed, God will do, we do this. We are paying it in advance of this thing we are believing God for. God will do it. You are, by doing it, after paying that seed, so it's such seed. It's not left for God to do his own part. He will do it. But do mm. not go and be discussing, I've done this, I've done No, it is just within you, your husband and God. Follow it you know, strictly. By so doing, it will be rewarded. God will really reward you. He say he is the reward of them that diligently seek him. That is the word of God for you. If you practice it, you will be you. Let us see the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two or of you shall agree on, to, on it as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven. I agree with unity. Where there's unity, where there's synergy, you see the family you know, doing things progressively. You see them growing very well. You see them progressing health wise, everything. Children will not be disobeyed. The disobedient will not be found among your children. You see your children growing according to the will of God. He said, I shall teach your children. It's scriptural. He said, I shall teach your children, Nazariah. When God teaches your children, it becomes perfect. When God set out to teach your children, because perfect, but the foundation has to be laid. It does not start from the surface. It starts from the foundation of the home. How did the marriage come together? Is, it, is God found in this marriage? By so doing, it shall grow well. Only seek the face of God together, and the God will reveal yourself, himself. Some of you sleep every night without remembering your dream. It's an error. When you dream, you wake up with your husband, discuss it. In your dream, God will speak to you and tell you what to do. You will rise up and discuss with your husband and pray together. After that, you call your family, your children to pray together. Always pray together with your children. Teach them the word of God early. Teach them the need to serve God. Teach them the need to follow God. You too, teach yourself, teach your husband. By so doing, you will grow very well. Not that this understanding will not come, it's bound to come because both of you are coming from different backgrounds. But it's the word of God that will make it to blend. It's the word of God that we, 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 we break the, 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 the bridge, we bridge the gap. We bring two, two of you together because we have understood one word, which is the scripture, no different scripture. You view it the same way and go about it the same way. You will feel. You know, spiritually balance, it will help you a lot. And also, even when, when your husband is not there, you will always know that the presence of God is there. 
There's one I keep telling people. If you are doing in secret, you are said nobody will see you. God is seeing you. Whom are you trying to respect? Is it God or man? It is better to fear God, but respect man. When you fear God, you will not do things that is against God in private. Because anything you are doing against your husband or against your wife, you are doing it against God. That's, it's a sin unto God. God will not be happy with you. So anywhere you are, remember that the presence of God is with you. Remember that Christ in you is the hope of all glory. Remember that anywhere you are, just as it's written in the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, he say, he that is born of God sinneth not, and he keepeth himself. Therefore, that wicked one tortured him not. So we, we, we what's two of you have understood that we are born of God. You are no longer of this world. See, I said that you are, no, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. In the book of John chapter 17, it said, Father, these ones are in the world. Please keep them for me. But they are not of the world. They heard my word, and they believe that you sent me, and they accepted and the word they shall speak. Please, may they may it fall on the fatal ground. That, that means we have been given an assignment. Think of how to go out for evangelism. Whatever you preach as husband and wife, you practice it. Evangelism helps couple to grow. You go out to evangelize. Go to areas, even the company you are living, make sure that you see people as light, so trouble will not be around you. You go out to do evangelism, go to hospital visit, do, do things in common. When you come back, you will refresh. You will say, yes, I've done good things for my father. You're like children who have done the will of their parents. They're always at peace with their parents. So also, if we do the will of God, we we'll always be at peace with God. Just take, for instance, any man that decided to go out of the marital home to, to cheat on the wife. When you come home, whether you like it or not, judgment will be on you. Your wife may not know, but within yourself, judgment is eating you up. The same thing applies to the woman. Anytime you cheat your husband, judgment will be cheated because the spirit of God does not accommodate cheating. The spirit of God that is in you does not welcome sin. Your body is the temple of God that he shall not share, no share it with any man. In the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you make your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is what? A reasonable, a reasonable service. Say, so be you not conformed with this world, but be you transformed. By doing what? Renew your mind. Everything we're talking about spiritual life is all about your mindset. How do you see the word of God? How do you welcome it to your mind? It helps you a lot to grow. Grow together, two of you. Renew your mind to, yes, we are excited to follow Jesus. No turning back. No any other thing will contradict our faith. It will help you a lot by, to keep your, your spiritual life running. Try we come, but when you are strong in the faith, you, you become unshakable. People will ask, what is the secret? You know that it's not your own problem, but it's God's own. You cannot kill yourself for a problem you know that God will solve. It's the only thing that you know you're supposed to do in the kingdom of God that you're not, you blame yourself. If I had known, I would have fasted. If I had known, I would have prayed. But you've done all this, is leave the rest to God. It will help, God will do his own. And I know he never failed. And he will never fail us in our time in Jesus' name. So my dear brethren, audience hearing me, while I'm still talking about spiritual life, togetherness. You cannot grow alone without your husband. Husband cannot grow alone without the wife. Both of you should grow and study the word of God. It's an iron, sharpness iron. So, so, so also the light of God will be shining on both of you. People may not know the secret, but you can say the secret to them by converting them, teaching, teach them how to grow in the things of God. That you become exemplary of Christ. It becomes representative of Christ anywhere you go. Even in the office, they will know you as a Christian, but not a, some Christians that make it difficult for one another. No. Christians are liberated ones. Those who are liberal to every situation, who are ready to offer help, who are ready to sacrifice you know, their time and money, and, you know, to help situation. That is Christianity. You don't say, I'm a Christian, I will not help. No, this. no, you are a Christian, you are God. You know what to do at every point in time. It's not just for studying Bible, going to church. Practical Christians render help. They are solution givers. The, you see people that cannot eat, you feed them. They give, you know, give, give out. Give their time, give their love. So what, but do it alongside with your couple. By so doing, you will be a complete Christian. And God will be happy with your home. When your children are in school, don't not shake because God is there. You've already paid your dues. 
How do you pay your dues? By paying your tithe, giving out the first fruit, paying off free, doing the work of God, increasing the kingdom of God, and decreasing the, the kingdom of darkness. By so doing, it, God will reward you and bless your home in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank um, you. I have a question. I was about to write it in the chat before you rounded up. Yes, And that is, this spiritual life together, <laughs> what if the spouse is not on the same level concerning the spiritual life? For instance, you are married and you are interested in being spiritual. You want to spend more time in the worship center. You want to spend more time praying and you want to do all these things, but the spouse is not interested. How do you go about it? Okay, good, good question. I started with it that you will have to study your husband. The one that is stronger in faith should be able to work on the one that is weak. Do not disobey your husband because you are in the church. No, 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 no. I'm going for fellowship, but your husband doesn't want you to go for that fellowship at that moment. Obey him. You live by example. When your husband sees the life you are living, he will be converted. Do not, you, you, I'm praying, I want to pray. And your husband needs attention. That is the time you want to pray. It's an error. Seek for his own, you know, his own comfort. Give him whatever he wants before you can focus on, on uh, prayers. By the time you are doing all these things, he will like to be distracting you because he doesn't know what Christianity is all about. He may be a weak, a weak Christian. Be following him as if you are a fool. Practicalize your, your Christianity with him. I have a testimony of a sister whose husband is a Christian. They all come to church, but the husband always drinks. After drinking, he will come and scatter the house. The, the woman, instead of quarreling, he will, he will clean the house, clean the husband, and he will come to the, the, the he will go to bed and sleep. When he wake up, you prepare water for him to bathe, give him food. The man never see the man, the woman here on, on him, or he will him for anything. He was accepting it every time. One day, the, the man said, this, where, this place you go to learn this kind of a thing. I will follow you to the place. The, with the woman's love and everything, the man followed. And the man, the man came in and became very fast brand in the things of God. He is not the one calling for prayers here and there. So you that is on top should bring up the one that is down to come up by leave, leaving, giving living example to your husband. Now, so for instance, you want to go for a program, your husband asks not to go because he doesn't know the importance of it. You agree. Do not disobey. Obey your husband. Then have, with time, the word of God will go deep. So when I study, it goes in. The word of God, the more I know, the more you study, the more it becomes of fit. You will go inside, the man will come up. By the time he comes up, you, you will be the one to prepare you for that program. Both of you will always go out for the program. But do not say, because I'm going for prison visitation. No, 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 leave me alone. No, arrange things peacefully. Keep for him, keep food. Say, well, honey, I'm going out for prison visitation. I'm going for hospital visitation. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to go for that hospital visitation now. I need you now. The other one needs you. You make a call to your colleagues, please. So my, my friends, you can go on. I have something to resolve in my home. You give me my attention. So I'm home will be at peace. Show the Christian you practice. His Christianity is not all about sleeping in church. It's all about putting them into practice. It will help you a lot to win the soul of your husband and your, the soul of your wife. Thank you. Any more questions? I hope we are following. No questions in the chat. Oh, are we already experts? Everything is okay. We are ready to be, if everything is okay, we should be volunteering to counsel others. Because we know that the challenges that we have in society today stem from the home. Stable homes make stable societies. I just saw on our M1 page now that uh, today is the International Day for Families. You know, there are so many days you can't keep up on all of them. Mm -hmm. And the Honorable Minister, Federal Minister of Women Affairs has advocated for creating awareness on issues relating to well-being of families which is regarded as the nucleus of any society. So thank God, even though we didn't know it, we're organizing this webinar with the hope of strengthening families. It's not just for ourselves, remember. We are looking at all this violence against women and girls, all this sexual assault, all this cultism, 
it became from broken homes, yes. families that were not together. So the question now is, how can we use what we have learned about having a stable home? We start with our own. Wherever there are cracks, we go and fill them. Wherever we have aired, we go and, yes. we go and, we go and make amends. Then as God is helping us to stabilize our home, homes, we go, we pray forth in a form of, we like call it social evangelism, to help other homes. There are many homes that are suffering and they come to us. Our immediate past president, Delta State, she told me that, she, she told us that during her tenure as president of uh, M1 Delta State, there were a number of homes that she noticed were suffering and they were breaking. Medical doctors, female doctors, men one members having problems in their homes. Now, if we don't have this training, how do we help? You cannot give what you don't have. So we need this. And from my life, I am in my 50s. I have looked around. Is it the court that will solve this problem? Many of the people in the courts don't even know what to do. Many of them have their own challenges. Is it the police? The only place I have seen where there seems to be some measure of hope is in the faith-based organizations. That is why we decided to approach people who are leaders in faith-based organizations to assist in organizing this. I haven't seen any school coming together and saying, we want to teach you about marriage. It's usually the, everything, all the marriage seminars I attended, it was either in the fellowship as a student or in the church. So I'm just wondering where else will we get this information so that we can have something to share with others and help. It's no longer about, oh, we want to celebrate uh, 16 days of activism ag against uh, violence against, and we all wear orange t-shirts and we snap photos. People are being beaten to death. Families are suffering. Women are pouring acid and poison in their husbands, stabbing. It shows that if something is wrong, and we cannot, and when we say, oh, this country is so bad, what is the president doing? Are we really expecting the president of Nigeria to solve all these problems? Even when we had our own colleague in Benue State that went to Facebook to voice her frustration because there was no counselor and mm -hmm. the governor came and donated money for their family. Is it every family that the governor can donate? So we should mm -hmm. look around us and think, how are we going to assist in making sure that all this becomes a reality. So thank you very much, um, Deaconess Lizzie Oyema. We thank God that even without knowing, we have done something to mark International Day of the Family. And our prayer is that <clears throat> all these lessons we are learning today will strengthen first our own families and empower us to strengthen other families. If other families are strengthened, you see all this cultism, all this robbery, kidnapping, they will diminish to the barest minimum. So we have another topic, which is financial oneness. That is also very interesting. Financial oneness. So we will call on the speaker to give us this next topic on financial oneness. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me there? Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. So, oneness. This is a very vital topic because you will agree with me that the world today is sustained by money and money sports. It is difficult to find any enterprise that can thrive without money in our modern society. Unlike in those days, where when somebody has a farm, he goes there and fetches whatever he wants and takes care of his family. Today it is not so. You find that people depend virtually on money. Financial stability, therefore, becomes one of the most important pillars of. Uh, marital enterprise. 
Many marriages today have crumbled due to lack of financial stability. Financial stability does not mean that one must be a millionaire or very wealthy. Financial stability is the ability for a family to formulate a sound financial policy based on Christian principles and thereby answer to their financial needs without violation of God's principles. Whatever you do in life, the moment you violate God's principles, of course, you have gone off beat and you are bound to crumble. So the way a couple handles its financial matters will definitely reflect in their marital relationship, whether positively or negatively. Where too much emphasis is placed on money and material things, then the relationship faces a great risk and danger of failure. Overindulgence in materialism has profound damaging effect on health, family life, moral character, both of parents and their children, and of course, the totality of the authentic being of any individual or family. Now, materialistic pursuits have been damaged, have damaging effect on the emotions, mentality, and even the physical well-being of anyone who indulges in it. Therefore, for you to live a healthy life and a fulfilled life, you have to uh, be less indulgent in money. The word of God says, let your moderation be known to all men. Therefore, finances are very important in a marriage, in a family. Now, in a family, a husband and wife must have a source of income. A Christian should work hard to earn a good living and should not fold his or her hands and expect God to throw down manna from heaven. It does not happen anymore. Some people are very proud and would not humble themselves to any available uh, uh, source of earning. They want to you know, uh, have it big and uh, they want a situation where they will you know, look flamboyant to end. It doesn't follow like that. There is a, an Igbo parable. We say that Aka uh, Jaja with Onomano Mano, your hands have to be dirty for you to have oil to put in your mouth. It means that you must walk first, suffer before pleasure. Now you find that the truth is that God honors a humble and honest person and a humble and honest beginning. God quickly shows such a person the way to the top when you go to the bottom in humility to ask God for help. Now, only God never fails those who trust in him. Only very few people in life have the privilege of taking a flight to the top without having to climb from the bottom. You know, like somebody who inherited money from his uh, millionaire parents, but of course, you know, it is rare. Most people go to the bottom, they fight it out, and then they begin to grow. It is wrong for a person to encourage his or her spouse to stay idle and refrain from engaging in any gainful venture, no matter how small. In some homes, you find that the man, well, maybe because they have money, he has money, he will ask the wife not to work at all. And there some men even place their wives on salary. <laughs> it is funny. I have seen a, situ a situation where a very wealthy man, you know, uh, had a wife, a full-time wife, and uh, the wife was doing nothing. At the end of the day, the man died in a car crash. And uh, the wife did not know how to do anything. All she knew how to do was to spend money. She was uh, globe trotting because the man had the resources. When the man died, she was shocked to the marrows of her bones because uh, <laughs> the man was owing many banks. By the time the banks finished with the family, they had little or nothing to continue with their old kind of life. And uh, it was terrible. The woman 
three, four years after her husband's death, if you see her, she was just like a slattern. It was unfortunate. Therefore, a couple must try as much as possible to find a source of livelihood. Now, Paul said in a uh, Second Thessalonians chapter three verse ten, that uh, is it. Neither did we eat any man's bread or not, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might be a uh, be uh, chargeable to no one of you. For even when we were with you, this we commanded, that if any man would not walk, neither should he eat. The Bible says so. If you will not walk, then you should not eat. Therefore, you must walk in honest labor for you to eat. Now, financial oneness. A husband and wife should endeavor to be honest to each other in everything, including in their finances. I was counseling a couple, and you know they are preparing for their wedding. And uh, when we talked about finances, financial oneness, the lady, the lady said, my money is for me. My husband's money is for us because he married me and uh, he must be ready to cater for me and take care of all my responsibilities. I should completely remove his eyes from my... I told him, the husband and wife should harmony. No two persons can ever agree. Mute, mute, doctor. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we are hearing you now. She has muted herself. All right. No two persons can ever agree in anything unless they are in agreement. I should give lecture. Hello? There is a lot of noise coming from that side. All right. In Amos 3.3, the Bible says, can two work together except they be agreed? Now, where there is no financial uh, harmony, between husband and wife, there is bound to be, you know, um, disharmony. Uh, the husband and wife must agree. That is why most married couples who are and stability experience unimaginable blessings and prosperity in their lives, including financial prosperity. What individual, each an individual can achieve. Um, a man and the wife achieve it 10 times. The Bible says that one will chase a thousand to fly, or two will change a uh, chase 10,000 to fly. They must be transparent to each other, Transp transparency in fiscal matters. A couple should be naked to each other in everything, including and especially in finances. For a marriage to be sustained in love, a couple must be consistent in fortrightness and transparency in fiscal matters so that Satan, the devil, will not tempt them. The devil knows that there is great power in unity. He knows that oneness and solidarity can move great mountains. And so he always works you know, at all times to scatter a relationship and uh, make them go their own ways. A couple must therefore be vigilant and watchful and must resist all tricks of the devil. They must submit to one another. It is very wrong for a spouse to hide uh, his or her income. Your husband should know every couple you earn and even other monies that come your hand from other places and vice versa, a wife should know everything about the husband. Each person must know and be fully aware of each, uh, everyone's uh, income. And uh, there should be no place for selfishness. It is wrong for a spouse 
to please his or her relatives without pleasing those of um, the other party. I think uh, my colleague said it when she was teaching, and so I don't need to overflog it. In financial matters, uh, you should not just concentrate on your people. Some women, they will earn plenty of money, even as big as their husband's income, or little below it. And uh, they will expect the husband to pay the house rent if they are not in their personal house, uh, train the children, make provision for feeding and everything, and even give her uh, money for her upkeep. So men do it. And uh, the woman will just keep her own money to herself and she'll be channeling it to her parents. That is very wrong. There was a matter that came before us. Uh, in that case, the man was, uh, you know, well, a young, a young man, but he has some source of income, a strong source of income. And so also the wife. Now, the wife was making money, and at the point she was even getting more money than the husband. What did she do? She built a house for her father in the village. Her own uh, nucleus family was still uh, in rented building. That is wrong. When the husband discovered it, of course, he wasn't happy at all. And he nearly broke the marriage, but for the timely intervention of some married counselors. You say no party uh, to a marriage should uh, be yoked together with any other person. Neither of the parties to the marriage is any longer yoked together with his or her parents. I think my colleagues also said so. The Bible said that you must leave and cleave to your spouse and you become one flesh. And that oneness is oneness indeed. Marriage does not, uh, you know, severe or destroy the relationship a parent has with their parents. No, they are not saying that with marriage, you will no longer have anything to do with your parents. You still have everything to do with them, but you and your spouse will relate to your parents as one man. No married person should channel his or her resources to the parents' uh, 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 place. First and foremost, you should take care of your immediate family. Then both of you should join hands to take care of your family. And taking care of your family, not scoring points. No, if uh, the woman's parents are in need and uh, you and your husband or you and your wife have the ability to answer to their needs, you should do it. And uh, on the other side too, if uh, the parents of the man are the people that have the need, they should help. You should not say, ah, because you spent a uh, hundred thousand naira for my uh, wife's parents, the other thing. Therefore, it is time to spend a hundred thousand naira for my parents. No, according to the needs. Praise the Lord. Now, it's a very important thing to have family budget. I discovered as a counselor that many families do not have budget. They just spend their resources anyhow. A couple should plan a periodic budget for the family. They should be careful to avoid unnecessary expenditure. Over ambitious plans must be avoided, bearing in mind that the mark of Christianity is moderation. The Bible says, let your moderation be known to all men. A couple should plan the family budget periodically, depending on, the, on their sources of income. It's advisable to plan a monthly budget. Of course, in Nigeria, uh, civil servants or people are, that are under remuneration, they earn their income once a month. Unlike uh, in some occidental countries where they receive weekly. They should make a list of their respective expenditures for the period. They should put away uh, put aside resources that will answer to their needs within this period. Now, the work of God must be taken care of. You know, propagation of the gospel, they should support the work of God. And I think my colleague spoke elaborately on that. Then, of course, they should make provision for feeding and toiletries. They should make provision for house rents if they are tenants or for maintenance of their home. I noticed in Nigeria that many people, when they build their house, give them 10, 15 years, the house will be dilapidated. Why? Lack of maintenance. No. You must maintain your home, and then you must set aside resources for that. Now, there should be resources set aside for apparels, 
for the members of the family, the man, the wife, and their children, and other people living with them. Medication, very important, healthcare, utility, such as electricity bills, water rates, and so on and so forth. Family education, you know, mental development, and so on, will be taken care of from your resources. Now, transport stroke maintenance. If you don't have a vehicle, there should be money for joining keke or a bus or taxi. If you have a car, you should fuel it and maintain it, monthly servicing. Maintenance of uh, maintenance and the financial support of the aged people at home. You must take care of your aged ones at home. Some people are very irresponsible in this area. Say, ah, after my income is small. No, no matter how small your income is, make it a point of duty not to neglect your aged parents at home or even your uncles and people who you look around, you find that they have no one taking care of them. God has made it your responsibility. You should take care of them. Now you must have savings for the family. Some people just live their lives like that. And when there is any eventuality, you see them, they crumble. No, there must be savings for the family. Bank savings. You must you should try and buy shares, you know, and uh, make diverse investments for the future then of course you should make provision for miscellaneous and sundry expenses, pocket money for each other. You know, the man should have uh, you know, free money to spend on other things and that uh, the wife also, especially the woman, when you pull the family resources together, you know that the woman has uh, greater needs. It's natural, it's normal. And uh, a, a, you know, a provision should be made for that. It's advised that uh, once fund is allocated to the various subheads, no matter what the need may be, no subhead should be tampered with to satisfy the need of another subhead. In other words, if the fund allocated to a subhead gets exhausted, then the need under the subhead should wait till the next period uh, of allocation. Otherwise, you'll find that you'll be robbing Peter to pay Paul. Now, when we talk about family savings, a couple should have family savings and investment for the future. It's very important. It is very, I, I see some people who have retired now. now. I have retired for a couple of years now. And then some of my colleagues, when I see them, I, I, I begin to wonder. They look so wretched, so dejected. What happened? Yes, they ate up their future when they were in service. They were living big. No, you must make provision for your future. It is very important to keep away something, no matter how small, for the rainy day. <laughs> there must be a rainy day, whether you like it or not. If possible, it is advised that a husband and wife should make joint savings and investments and uh, maintain joint accounts, bank accounts. Uh, in some places where we went to minister, I find that uh, many people, even men of God, are in, in opposition to that. They don't want to hear joint savings account. It's all right. All their financial transactions should be carried out in one accord. If, however, they find it difficult to maintain a joint account for whatever reasons, well, they have to work out um, a means of uh, their finances. They should uh, work out an acceptable means of managing their finances and savings in such a way that to both of them without qualms and without resentment to either party. Some people think that they would need to earn all the money in the world before they can for the future. That's not true. The secret of savings and investment for the future is that little drop of water eventually makes a mighty ocean. If, for example, you earn just 10,000 naira a month, if you put away 500 naira, that's, that will not be too much, but you'll be surprised that at the end of the year, engage the services of a stock broker and buy shares from viable corporate organizations as small as your resources can afford. This is very good. So that tomorrow you'll be surprised what you have saved through that means. I have a colleague, she's a, 
a medical doctor, and uh, she was investing in shares. And after a couple of years, when she now saw what it has yielded, she used it to build herself a, a clinic that is enviable. And uh, she now said, well, this is my retirement. When I retire from the public service, I will fall back to this. So savings should be a one-way valve. Neither refer to it at any time or think of touching it, but just keep it aside. So don't keep too much at a time. Keep just a little so that um, it will not affect your daily living because you have to live first today before you begin to think of tomorrow. Some people say that their incomes are too small and they cannot save, but they spend money on certain things that are not too important. They think that, you know, uh, by living flashy life, yeah, they are on top of the world. It's not true. You find that some people can conveniently do without some of those things. I remember uh, there was a matter that came before one uh, uh, judge when we had been in the state. And uh, the man, when he was uh, passing his judgment, he told the young man, said, look, if you cannot afford to drink Coca-Cola or Fanta, please pretend that they don't exist for you so that you don't steal. And uh, I don't ever forget that uh, saying. He said, buy clothes only when the needs arise. Some people, you know, they just buy every fashion in vogue. It's funny. I think that is silly. Buy clothes only when you need it. You will have money to buy better clothes tomorrow when the tide of poverty and the low income will be over. If, however, you get to the end of your journey in life without the necessity of falling back to the money you have saved, then, of course, the Bible says in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, that a good man liveth an inheritance to his children. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We must quickly add that parents should not make it, um, you know, their uppermost ambition to leave outlandish bequests for their children. Because we also know of uh, some parents who kept uh, big uh, money of bequests for their children and uh, they made no sense of the whole thing. If you look at Nigeria today, you find that many people who have a big inheritance from their parents, many of them are loafers. They cannot even add value to their lives. The little their parents left for them before a short time, they squander it. Many of them are in courts because of what their parents left for them. But all the same, it is good to leave something for your children. Financial discretion or indiscretion. Now, whether or not a couple maintains joint accounts, the thing that should determine their determine uh, that should determine their de destination in the marital adventure and make or mar the enterprise is their disposition towards expenditure. How do you spend? Some people, especially some women, are spendthrift. I remember one day, um, one married counselor came to my church. And in the process of administration, he made a statement. He said, many of you women, the money that your husband would have used to buy blocks or to mold blocks to give you a shelter, you are using it to buy a wrapper. He said, go to some women's homes. If you open their box, <laughs> you see Abada, you see George, and you see all kinds of things. He entered their room, you find, Many pairs of shoes that are not necessary. So many things. Now, financial discretion helps a family to stand on a solid foundation and, prop and uh, proper moderation. But financial indiscretion brings a couple down swiftly to the pit of, the, of poverty. In planning the family budget, therefore, a couple should be careful to avoid over ambitious plans an unnecessary expenditure. They must bear in mind that the mark of Christianity is moderation. They should cut their coat, not just according to their size, but also according to their cloth. They must be realistic and practical in whatever they set their hands to do. Being naked to each other as husband and wife, 
are not mindful of high and lofty things. For a marriage to be sustained in love, a couple must be consistent in modesty. They must be modest. They must be forthright and transparently honest to each other, especially in fiscal matters. I found that even a woman that can open herself to her husband in the privacy of their bedroom without hiding her nakedness and everything, when it comes to financial matters, you see her hiding. What are you hiding? If you drop dead, that thing you are, money you are hiding belongs to your wife and your husband or your wife and your children. When you do that, of course, Satan will see that as an avenue to tempt you and pull you down. The devil knows that uh, greed is utterly destructive. He knows that avariciousness can drag any person from the mountain top to the bottomless pit. And so he always walks over, uh, in, over time to tempt couples, especially women, to be greedy. And so he weakens them and obfuscate the family finances. A couple must therefore be vigilant and watchful and must resi resist every trick of the devil to pull them down in that way. They must submit and open their hearts plainly to God in financial matters for godly and harmonious living. When you live a godly and harmonious life, you find that at times I went to shop right one day with my wife and I saw a young couple. They were just, uh, well, should I call them middle class? <laughs> there is no more middle class in Nigeria now. Uh, you know, uh, 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 middle uh, power public servants. You know, somebody whose salary is not even up to 100,000 naira a month. When I saw the kind of thing they were buying, I was asking myself, what are they doing with all this? You know? all these fridges, so many things. They are just buying and buying and buying and buying. I ask myself, what are they going to do with all this? The Bible says, spend not your money on that which is not food. Basically, make provision for food that will nourish you and your family. Then once in a while, of course, you can go out to flex and spend you know, little money on other things. But don't look at people. Uh, those people are buying, so let me buy. No, don't do that. It is very wrong for a spouse to embark on any expenditure without the knowledge or consent of his or her partner, just because he or she wants to impress people or merely because he or she sees some other people spending money and therefore you want to spend. In the first place, you don't even know the source of their income. Some of them are thieves. Expenditure should be reasonably tied to your budget. Unnecessary purchase or Expenses should be avoided. Expenses not included in your family budget should be avoided. Some people, especially women, spend fortunes buying clothes and jewelries at the expense of most other important necessities in the family. Critical evaluation of the content of this. Of this. Some women's wardrobes, if you go into their wardrobes, you marvel what you see. Jewelries, perfumes, makeups, and all sorts of things. <laughs> Couples are advised to make purchases only in response to genuine needs, even when they are financially stable. Let me tell you, I have a friend. He retired as a professor in Uniben. I knew this man more than uh, 35 years ago. Very prudent man. And uh, if you get to his home, he dresses moderately, he eats moderately, he behaves moderately. And I noticed that this man was a great you know, giver. Many indigenous students in Uniben, he helped them. Some from Cameroon, from, some from Togo, some from Nigeria. He was helping them. And today, ah, uh, come and see. They don't play with him. Couples should avoid imitation. Don't imitate anybody. They should not look at people or consider what people may say or think about them. Those who mock people because they are not living up to expectation are idle, uh, wayward people. In fact, I see them as uh, people who are not serious in life. You do not need to live up to the expectation of anybody. 
create your own standard according to Christian principles and stick to it. Only do not look dirty and untidy. Some people dress moderately and yet they look clean and decent. Whereas some people spend fortunes dressing only to look like scarecrows. <laughs> Unfortunately, they live sorrowing because they live borrowing or stealing and cheating. Keep no place for financial indiscretion. Let your moderation be known to all men. Now, some people have wrong conception about money and finances. Some people labor under the false belief that money is everything. Yes, the Bible says uh, money is a defense, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12. Then money answered all things, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 9 and 19. Some people conduct themselves contrary to the will of God, and uh, they no longer see anything wrong in using money to do evil. They use money to perpetrate all sorts of evil and to do all sorts of things, you know, and uh, that is wrong. But the truth is that money is not everything. <laughs> Material wealth is not everything. The Lord Jesus Christ made us to understand in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses here on earth. And Apostle Paul made it clear to us that is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, that people of perverse and corrupt minds suppose that money is gain or godliness. You know, some people, uh, when they come, those are people who go to bribe pastor with uh, seed faith and, uh, uh, you know, uh, big offerings and tithes and all those things to impress. It's good to tithe in church because if you don't do that, uh, the outgoings and the other sundry expenses in the church Electricity bill or a pastor's salary will not be paid. But you must, the Bible says you cannot give what you don't have. The Holy Bible did not fail to show us the negative attributes of money. In Matthew 28, verse 12 to 15, money was offered as bribe to soldiers to induce them to give false report about the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Also, in Luke chapter 22, verse 5, money was offered as bread to Judas, one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, to induce him to betray his Lord and Master. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 8 20 to 24, Simon the sorcerer offered money to the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as inducement for them to enable him to uh, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate that these days, People say they, they tap into anointing. It is unscriptural. I did not see, I've tried to, I've done a big research on that. There is nowhere in the Bible where the Bible says you have to sow money to tap into any anointing. No, 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 no. God gives our spiritual gift as it pleases him. Apostle Paul instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 6 to 10. And uh, let me read it. He said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out of it. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many false and foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and, uh, ped um, and perdition. For the love of money, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Christians are joined heads with the Lord Jesus Christ in God's heritage. A Christian couple is a micro unit of the macro pure family of God, the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why if your marriage is uh, correct, according to God's principle, you'll find that you have a foretaste of heaven. The unity and peace that uh, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have in heaven will also be in your home. Every Christian has a right to partake in God's benison. 
Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, that Christians are God's children. They are joined heirs with Christ. And according to Paul uh, in Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Christians, couples, are heirs together of the grace of life. The grace of life is not money and material wealth. The grace of life is God's promise to his faithful servants. Riches and, and uh, what money can do are very important. <laughs> Without money, of course, like I said when I started, it's like money is at, uh, underscores everything we do here on earth. But Christians should not make that their focus. The Lord Jesus Christ instructed Christians in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that things will be, other things will be added unto them. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then of course we are of all men most miserable. It is unfortunate that ungodly men have crept into the church of Christ today, and they have deceived many people, many Christians. And today most people worship money and the God of money, that is mammon, instead of Jehovah, the true living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The ungodly teachers, that is uh, prosperity teachers, teach that Christians do not depend on their legitimate income, but on divine provision. Of course, we, divide, we depend on divine provision. But if you don't depend on your legitimate income, well, I don't know that you're a thief. That is very wrong. It's a very wrong teaching. Because the so-called divine provision that uh, have been turned to bribery, extortion, and all sorts of corrupt practices. I remember when, it, when I was in service, uh, many of my colleagues, they mocked me that, uh, that I'm too fastidious. Uh, what do you mean? Even when they give you ordinary gifts, you will not take. I say, I have to understand the, so the source and the meaning of that gift before I take it. And many a time, God has saved me from all kind of mess. People who came and dropped money, and uh, he said, what's that? He said, ah, oh God, just to greet you now. I said, thank you very much. Take it away. And some of the time, you find that these people are people who earn less than you. Shortly after that, certain things came to my table. And when I looked at it, I said, ah, thank God I did not take this man's money. He had come to bribe me. A Christian should depend on his income. What he needs is careful planning and careful spending through proper budgeting. God may bless you with a gift from time to time, but we must also remember that surely oppression maketh a wise man rich, and a gift destroyed the heart. When people come and begin to give you gift anyhow, unwarranted gift, like I said earlier, you find that uh, <laughs> they will ensnare you. And that's what the Bible is talking in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. And according to Jude, uh, in his epistle, uh, Jude is only one chapter, verse 4, 11 to 13, and verse 16. He says, there are certain men who have crept into us on our way, who we are before uh, 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 time ordained to condemnation. They crept into the church, and uh, they masqueraded themselves, but with time, of course, you find that they are misleading people to go astray. And uh, to such seducers, Prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22, such with lies, you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hand of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked ways by promising him life. Go to many of our Pentecostal churches today. You will see four nine people, Yahoo, Yahoo boys, and all manner of, uh, you know, uh, 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 people. You'll hear the man of God promise that he shall be well with you. Uh, if you are trekking this year, by this time next year, you'll be riding a car, this and that. You will build a mansion. And these people, you hear the whole church, hey, 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 praise the Lord. You should tell them, that godliness with contentment is great gain. These are the prophets of the last days. According to Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, they have departed from the faith 
giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of the devil, they speak lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. Apostle Paul warned that the time will come, and of course, we are living in that time, when people will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away from, uh, from the truth. Today, you find that Many women almost worship the man of God. The respect they will never accord their husbands. You see them cringing before the man of God. Please, with due respect, I am not saying that you should not honor and respect a man of God. But if I see you according more respect and honor to a man of God than you give to your husband, then I see you as a silly person. Paul wants us in first Corinthians um, uh, in uh, sorry Apostle John warned us in first John chapter 4 he said beloved believe not every spirit it's not everything you hear from men of God that you believe he said you must try them to know whether they are of God he said because many false prophets are gone out into the world they are the world they are in the world and they are seducing everyone. Money is very important. It is needed for any enterprise to succeed, including marriage. However, there are Christian principles that govern the attitude towards money. The acquisition of money and the use of money by Christians is very important to God. And uh, the way you go about it is very important to God. This will determine the effect money will have on you. Now, attitude towards money, what kind of attitude do you have to, supposed to have towards money? To some people, money is the all and all. It is the end of all things. I, I hear some young uh, school dropouts these days, they say that their school is a scam. You know, money is everything. And uh, they go into Yahoo, Yahoo. Well, they make money, but watch them. Many of them don't last up to two, three, five years. They will crumble. Money is really very important, and no one can actually do without money in our contemporary world, no matter how holy or spiritual the person may be. However, the attitude of a person towards money is very important. Some people worship money. They see money as the alpha and omega, the great and uh, big God that answers all needs. Some people proclaim that after God, <laughs> the next thing is money. As a matter of fact, they only say after God. The truth is that they have placed money above God. And Jesus Christ said that anything that men hold at high esteem is an unto him. Money is their God, and they are controlled by money. Their reasoning is subject to the comp compulsion and you know, dictates of money, and that is a big error. Our attitude towards money should uh, be humility. If God blesses you with money, use it to answer to your needs. Uh, and uh, in the house of God, do as much as possible you can. I hear my sister Lizzie talking about adopting children and helping them. You may not necessarily even adopt, but you can also help them in their parents' homes. People who are in need, who you know genuinely they are in need and they have nobody to help them. It is not out of place if you pay school fees for somebody who is not your biological child or somebody who is not even known to you. Even your street neighbors, you know, you can help them. Now, how do we acquire this money? The Holy Bible told us much about how to acquire money. Uh, it has the, uh, In the Proverbs chapter 23, from verse 1 to 12, the Bible says, When thou sitest to eat with the ruler, Consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thy own wisdom. Will thou set thy eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an ego towards heaven. Eat thou not bread of him 
that had an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meat, for as he thinketh in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, said, the, uh, said he to thee. But his which thou hast eaten, thou shalt vomit up again and lose thy sweet words. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the field of the fatherless. For their redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. Apply thy heart unto instructions and thy ear to the word of knowledge. This is the word of God. I know of a, a, a young man, and uh, when the uh, state was created in 1991 newly, the man went coming this way, you know, traveling to the east, his uh, hometown. I remember one day I counted 15 cars in convoy. And when he entered the petrol station, they would just come, bring out their pump passion, pa, 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 say, hey, your guy don't come. They will drive away every other person in the station. They will fill his cars, all the cars. The man does not come and say how much he sees that. He will just bring out bundles of money and throw, then spray money. People run. So whenever he came around, people say, ah, I better make come up, better people don't come. But as I'm talking to you sincerely, I know him very well. The man has only one jalopy uh, 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 car, you know, an SUV car he bought more than uh, uh, nine years ago, Belgium. Before he, this man never bought Belgium, he would buy Tierra, but now he's buying Belgium. And the Belgium he bought about nine years ago, he's so rickety now. are not forbidding fraud and making money. In fact, Christians are encouraged to work very hard and not to, to languish in idleness and unproductiveness. They say if you not work, you should not eat. The Holy Bible, you know, says it, you know, in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10 to 11. It says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and sleep so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed robber. This same statement is repeated in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 33, to show how serious it is for one to work hard. But the Holy Bible also admonishes God's fearing people. He say, labor not to be rich, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4. He say, the reason is very simple. Anyone who labors to be rich is ruthless in all his ways. He throws caution to the wind and pushes money recklessly, but he pursues money recklessly. Such a person is neither faithful to God or even to man. He can cheat, he can steal, he can kill or do anything to uh, get money. All he wants is to get money. The word of God says, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Whether in the medical practice, I know of a, a young man during my youth call. He said that uh, before the end of the youth call, he must buy a car. And uh, the place where he was staying, he converted it to um, you know, a theater. Uh, you know, what was he doing? Criminal abortion. And he did it so much that really before the middle of the youth call, he had bought a car. He was living a flashy life. I don't envy such people. Now, the Bible says that he that hasted to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 22. We live in a world that has become uh, retrogressively uh, difficult to survive in. Look at Nigeria today. It's just unfortunate. If you go to the market to buy something today for 5,000 Naira, go in a week's time, they will tell you 15,000. It's unfortunate. The cost of living has escalated and is still deteriorating by the day. As long as we live in this world, the conditions that are persisting in our contemporary physical world are bound also to affect Christians. Christians are not exempted from economic hardship in the world. They are afflicted by various harsh measures in the world. Now, the Christian suffers even more because he cannot do anything that unbelievers are doing. But guess what? His decision 
to keep uh, clean uh, will be handsomely rewarded by God. The general slogan is, if you can beat them, join them. But the Christian is not, uh, who is not a church goer, because there are many church goers today. And they are the perpetrators of all nonsense that they say Christians, Christians. No, a Christian lives according to the principles of the Bible. And uh, the motto of a Christian is, if you can't beat them, don't join them. Stand out from them on God's standard, even though you suffer. Uh, Sophocles, a Greek writer, he says, for mortal, greatly to live is greatly to suffer. And uh, the Bible, of course, told us about their suffering, that he that will not suffer with Christ will not reign with him. The fear of suffering often drives many people, uh, you know, even church goers, to all sorts of uh, inauspicious things. And their problem is even complicated by the legion of uh, infernal apostles, false preachers, prosperity teachers that give them false hope. A Christian should work hard to make good money, but he must do it in the way of God. Let me tell you the truth. The money you earn with your hard you know, uh, labor, you don't spend it anyhow. You help people quite all right. And uh, you also help yourself, but you will not spend it anyhow. A Christian only acquires, you know, uh, requires to be faithful in business and in whatever he is doing for a living. A Christian family should be faithful to God. They should be honest and straightforward in whatever they do. The blessing of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrow to it, says Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. God loves a hardworking person or couple, and he helps them to excel. That is what the Holy Bible says in Proverbs 10, 4. He says, he become a poor that dealeth with a slack hand. God does not encourage, you know, slackness or idleness. Therefore, a Christian must work hard, but even then, you must, uh, you must be, uh, you, you know, you must diligently hold on to God. Praise the Lord. Now, let us talk about uh, how to use money. We are talking about uh, how to make money. How do we use it? The word of God means Christians to understand that whatever God blesses them with is not for them alone, but for the benefit of all and sundry, especially those in need. Couples should therefore realize that they are mere custodians of their earthly possessions. God puts such possessions in their care for the benefit of those who are in need of them, especially those in the household of faith. God will ask every one of us to give account of how uh, we spend the opportunities we have and how we appropriate all the things that you have made to come our way. A Christian couple should therefore use whatever God blesses him with to glorify God by using them to promote the work of God first and foremost through ministering to the poor and supporting the work of God, both in the church and outside the church. I always tell people, uh, people think that uh, you do the work of God when you give plenty of money to the pastor, pay big uh, tithe, and give big offering, so seed feed. Look, <laughs> most of these are gimmicks by the so-called men of God, and you see them living flashy life, and you, you are just uh, managing to survive. Like I said before, I encourage giving to the house of God and giving to people. But first and foremost, there is what God commands and encourages us to. Much as we do, uh, you know, uh, try to promote the work of ministry by helping men of God and men of God who are in need, not those who are living far above your income and then you are also using your less, uh, little income to support them. That's not what the Bible teaches. If you look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible says that in Christian giving, it is not to um, enrich one person and to impoverish another person, but let there be equality in the, in the house of God, that those who do not have will give to those who have, and those who have will give to those who do not have. Now, a Christian who does? Couple, Spoken a Christian, so well. Hello? A Christian couple, you've spoken so. I should stop. 
Hello. Carry on, carry on, carry on. She was cheering you on. Okay. A Christian couple should learn to give to the poor and the needy. This is very important. I don't know how I will feel, for instance, I come to the church on a Sunday morning. I see a young man who is supposed to be maybe somewhere far away in the university and uh, whose parents I know are poor and indigent. Or the parents may not even be members of the church. They are there in the village. They are poor farmers. And this child, you know him to be zealous in the church. And uh, you knew where he gained the admission and went to school. And he went by faith. And he now came to the church. You saw him the first Sunday. The next Sunday, you also saw him. And then you are comfortable. No? You should call him and say, a young man, what's going on? Are you not in school? And if you hear that he is out of school because he has no source of uh, sustaining himself in the school, for God's sake, if you have the means, it is not out of place. If you send him back to school, heaven should be happy. The Bible says that he that had pity upon the poor lended unto the Lord, and that which he had given will be paid him back. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Whoso stoppeth his ear at the cry of the poor, he shall also cry himself, but shall not be heard. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his ears or his eyes shall be cursed. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 27. Now, the most potent key to financial breakthrough in life is ministering to the poor and the needy. Many people in the church today have been led astray by the teachings of some uh, false teachers and preachers who make church members believe that once they give all their resources to the church and to the preacher or minister, then they have given to God. And God's blessings for givers will become theirs. <laughs> Most of the contemporary teachers and preachers, you know, uh, 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 they are lovers of their own selves. They are covetous, boasters, proud. The man will extort you, take all your money, and tomorrow will be boasting and tell you how many houses he has. A church one day, I was telling us that is, without, you know, this will have no natural affection. God enjoins us to have pity for the poor. You must have affection for them. Praise the Lord. Now, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, many people have misconstrued the word of God in so many ways. And uh, where the Bible makes us to help the poor, they make you believe that it is to help the men of God. It is not so. The New Testament did not even focus on that. They talk about Christian believers, the household of faith. You see, there are people who creep into uh, widows' houses and lead captive silly women uh, with their uh, laden sins led them with a diverse loss, ever learning and never be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy chapter 3, 27, uh, 2 to 7. They often confuse their members and followers with quotations from the Holy Bible, such as give and shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed together. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It's good to give, they, but they misconstrue that scripture and give it a meaning which the Lord Jesus Christ never intended. By supporting that, supposing that one would receive blessing from God in uh, you know uh, a commensurate measure with the amount of money or things that they give to pastors and religious leaders. No, if a pastor is in need and you have the ability, please give to him. But don't neglect the poor and indigent brothers and sisters in the church. It is very good and, so, and scriptural to give to the church and to religious leaders to meet necessary uh, needs. But that is not what the Bible is talking about. A careful study of the whole of Luke chapter 6 and many other relevant scriptures will show that the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned about showing mercy to the poor and the needy. As a family, as a woman and wife, you should not forget the poor. You must always have them in front of your mind, not at the back of your mind. Now we must support the work of God. A Christian couple should make it's a point of duty to support the work of God. God cannot come down from heaven to propagate the gospel here on earth. So it is, you, it is the responsibility of Christians to do that. Therefore, we must do everything. We must go out to preach, and we also uh, make money available to support 
the word of God. If you cannot go, support those who are going. There are many missionaries in the field who are in need. As a matter of fact, those are the, even the people the Bible is saying you should support in supporting the work of God. Some missionaries, they go to the interiors where our flashy pastors can never go. And uh, nobody cares about them. We should care about them. There is also a charge on all Christians by Apostle Paul. You know, uh, he says, but what thou in all things? I'm reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. And your affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. Christians are charged to be partakers in building God's kingdom here on earth by engaging themselves in faithful service unto God in line with the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a parable which says, your conduct shall so loud and bless the hearing of those you are talking to that they cannot even hear what you are saying. But you're, you know, but say that people are persuaded to learn from your conduct. When you are talking, when you are shouting and saying, do this, do that, do that, people are hearing you, but uh, sincerely speaking, their ears are blocked. But when they see you living a life, an exemplary life, oh, come on, they are persuaded and uh, you see them doing what they find you doing. Therefore, we must try as much as possible to support the work of God. But in supporting the work of God, we must do it the proper way. Uh, they should be known in their immediate environment. You should be known in your immediate environment as well as in your place of work, um, in your business, as a faithful Christian and not as a wayward or cruel person. Some people, even so-called Christians, if they have money, they become very arrogant. They talk to people anyhow. They treat people anyhow. No, that is not what your money should do. Your money should make you to be even humble, realizing that it is God that gave it to you. You shall know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. A Christian or a Christian couple should live an exemplary life that will so much challenge the people living in their neighborhood and the people working and doing business with them and provoke them to desire to give their lives to God through Jesus Christ. My sister was talking before, talking about a woman being submissive to her husband. That when the husband said, don't go to church, obey him. And they would say, don't do this, obey him, but live a life that will show him that uh, uh, there is something in you. I tell you, before long, this man will desire to follow you to go to where you have gone to learn this wonderful um, way of life. Also, when you are, your Christianity is, you know, showing people indeed uh, the way of Christ, you don't need to preach too, for too long for them to surrender and start following you. Then they should follow it up. You should follow it up with evangelism and uh, you should motiv motivate them with love. A couple should, you know, uh, participate in personal evangelism. Your financial oneness will not now make you to go above the command of the Lord. Say, go ye and preach to all nations. We should go and preach to people. It is not enough for a Christian to make money available uh, and think that uh, that is all that is required for the gospel to spread. Every Christian is required to go out and preach the gospel. You and your wife, you and your husband, you should buy Bibles. If God bless you, take her, load your book, book with Bible. Drive to a, a village, uh, places you don't even know. Come there, buy a, 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 what, what they call it, megaphone, preach to the people there, and uh, distribute the Bible to them. By the time you go there two or three times, I'm telling you, a church will start in that place. You can go to prison visits, hospital visits, you can visit the lonely and disadvantaged people, and so on and so forth, orphanages, and show them the love of Christ by preaching the word of God to them, teaching them. The, work, the word of God, and encouraging them to um, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things your money should do. And when you do that in unity with your wife, with your husband, heaven is glorified. A couple should support its local church financially and otherwise, because without such support, the church may not be able to uh, be sustained. The church needs money to pay full-time church, uh, church workers, 
and also to pay their bills. Supporting the work of God is, however, not only in local churches, in our modern way of living, which is in, res um, in response to the economic realities of our time, it is difficult for most people to engage themselves in evan evangelism, effectively you know, to distant places on full scale. There are, however, some people who have given themselves to full-time evangelism. You should support such people. You should help them. You should give them clothes, buy clothes for them. Sometimes your second-hand clothes that you have worn, Sometimes buy new ones for them. Help them in sundry ways. Let me tell you, if you have the means to buy a car for an evangelist to go into the interiors, it is not out of place. Praise the Lord. So financial oneness is very important in a, a marriage. And the husbands and wife should be in one accord, physically, materially, and uh, spiritually. They should be open to each other in everything. Uh, my sister have talked about tithing and also talked about it. It's good to support the work of God. Marriage, uh, uh, um, so that um, you should uh, operate in such a way that you will be seen as one in everything. Let, let your oneness not only be in a, you know, a, on the bed. No. Uh, your fusion on the bed is very important. That's a, uh, you know, a very vital connubial duty, marital duty. But then your financial oneness is also important too. And uh, when you do things in one accord, you are glorifying God. Because God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, did everything in unity. And uh, the name of God is glorified. And even we, we are created in God's image. And our homes are supposed to be the fourth taste of heaven. And the, all the principles that the Lord has taught us in the scriptures, we should put it to place and uh, live a life that is healthy. Help the church, help the poor and needy, and uh, put your resources together as a husband and wife. Don't do things selfishly or individually, but do as one man. Help your parents, help the parents of your spouse as one man. And you'll find that this financial harmony we bring great peace and uh, tranquility in your marriage. May the Lord bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Wow. Elder, you have given us so much food for thought. <laughs> I hope we'll be able to take time to digest it because we have been taught indeed. Um, there is one question in the chat which says, if the wife is keeping to the financial plan, but the husband is going against the financial plan, is it better for them to agree on some common bills like rent, school fees, and so on, and manage the rest of their finances separately? Uh, you see, these uh, teachings, I want us to take them holistically. If you look at our very first teaching, we talked about the fear of God. And that is why, too, I, I always uh, tell people, the Bible says, go outside into the field, gather your materials, and come in and build your house. What's the meaning of that? The foundation of everything is very important. See, if you go out to build a house without digging deep into the, into the soil, you find that uh, that house is bound to fall. It's going to have cracks and it will collapse. Therefore, first and foremost, let your marriage be founded on the principle of Christianity, the fear of God. And where you have the fear of God, no spouse will do anything contrary to the will of God. Having said that, well, there are people who got married before they gave their life to Christ. And in that case, you find that it may be the woman that gave her life to Christ or the man after the marriage. What do you do when you find that you are bringing everything and the other person is withholding? Now, um, our counsel in that area is this. You see, when people come with, sometimes I don't like answering general questions like this because you find that uh, some people may not uh, fly on it to do some funny things. But let me just say something now. Uh, you find that between the husband and wife, before one spouse begins like that, something, if you interview them very well, you'll find that something has happened here and there, here and there. But let's talk it on the face value. If you now find that one person is withholding, well, uh, like I said when I was talking, it's not only joint accounts. If both of you cannot sustain joint accounts, joint accounts, you can decide 
how to make a contribution together so that you uh, finance the needs of the home. And like you rightly said, if it's okay, you pay the house rent, you do that, you do that, you do that. Then so be it, and uh, each person should do it um, religiously. Uh, but uh, I will always advise spouses that uh, when you do things together, it is much, much better and lovely. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Is there any other question? Nobody has written anything in the chat. But I can see our participants are increasing. We went as high as uh, 31, 32, and we have dropped to 27. So we are still engaged. When we started, we we're just about, uh, we are going to go to the last topic, and that is um, by Dickness Lizzie Onyema. And this topic is very important because parenting is also another issue that is affecting the stability of habit. We are supposed to be celebrating International Day of the Boy Child. We've done so much about the girl child and everybody has been complaining. If you educate so many girls and you don't educate the boys, who will the girls marry? So Medical Women's Association of Nigeria through the young doctors will be celebrating International Day of the Boy Child. And so in that spirit, we are hoping we're going to learn some things that we as parents need to make sure that in bringing up our children in order to have stable homes. Now, I'll just be, I'm very happy to say I have been working in this area of using faith-based organization to promote health in different ways, family health and so on. And by the special grace of God, um, we submitted, myself and my co-author submit, author, submitted a paper to the International AIDS Society HIV Science Conference. And it's titled Working with Christian Faith-Based Organizations to Prevent HIV AIDS and Unwanted Pregnancy in Delta State of Nigeria. And when I was in the Ministry of Health, we were able to fund a project in Wari South local government area where we got a volunteer who was going to talk about health issues in different churches. And he was able to, in one year, go to a total of 50 churches. And it is that work that we have submitted and has been accepted for presentation in July. So I just want using faith-based organizations as a target group for a lot of our health programs. If they are very, very structured, they are easy to reach. You can meet a large group of people at a, a, a short time, more than you will meet in the health facility. And it is easy for you to follow up. Furthermore, in 2014, another aspect of the research we did was presented in Oxford by one of our co-authors, measuring the impact and role of faith-based organizations in reversing the trend of HIV. And this was at the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So just in case you have not worked with faith-based organizations, I want you to get into that as an opportunity to see how to scale up a lot of social mobilization efforts. Because one thing M1 does is social mobilization. You'll be surprised that just by going to different faith-based organizations, giving 10 to 15 minute talks, share flyers and so on, we can change a lot of things. Recently in uh, Iseluku, there is a report of a gang of is it six or seven young men who raped a young girl whether it was because of courtesy or whether she offended one of them. But what I was wondering, even if the one person, the ringleader, even if that ringleader is possessed, the remaining six people that joined him in the gang rape, are they all possessed? Where are their mothers? Where are their fathers? When did they get to this point where somebody can suggest such evil and they will accept and go and do it? And what do we tell our young boys? If you hear of people planning such evil, speak out so that you don't become an accessory to their crime. So we are hoping that by the grace of God, if we can get it right with parenting, 
and we can get other parents to improve their parenting skills that some of the ills in our society will be changed. I'm seeing a hand up. And, yes. Um, yes, please. Mm. Can, can you I speak? come on? Yes, please do so. Yeah. Dr. So it is, yes. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Ma, for further educating us. We are talking about how to make money and how we should spend our money in, in a Christian home. But just like you said, some people got born again after they got married. And we have a setting, or I have a case right now, where the man, woman is born again and the man is not. And there has been a lot of financial crisis in the home where the man, like you said, is withholding. Well, he claims that the woman earns more than him. And because of that, he doesn't want to take care of most things in the, in the house. And the woman says she's tired, she wants to leave the home. So she has actually left, but now she wants to divorce. How do you put such people together again? I don't know what to do. I think I can get help from this kind of educative uh, uh, lecture. Then the second one is the issue of tithing. Just two weeks ago, one of our pastors was saying that um, tithing is of the Old Testament. The New Testament, you can do more than one of us. You can give us your heart desire. You know, all this. We've stopped hearing you. Can you raise your voice? So what testament did you hear me? You talked about tithing that okay. just uh -huh. a few days okay. ago. Yes. A pastor. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, a pastor was saying that uh, it, it was the, in the Old Testament that uh, they gave uh, uh, one over 10. But now, it just as you had desire, if you can give it over 10, nine over 10, so, uh, so be it. So I was also thinking there was a time to the wind blew and people were saying, don't tithe. Pastors are robbing us by telling us to tithe. That aside, but again, looking at tithing and looking at the blessings that follow tithing, why would I have thought that most Christian who have practiced tithing um, as commanded, you no, know, we'd be so blessed. But we are not saying such a thing. We are not saying, is it that we are not giving rightly? There's something wrong with our giving or we are not giving in the right place? And all of that and all of that. So I just want to know and clarify my mind on all these things. Thank you. My question is to Daddy Shafts. Hello? Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can we hear can me? hear you. All right. Let me start uh, with the first yes, one. Yes, we are hearing you. All right. Let me start with the first one. Um, talking about uh, a situation where the man or the wife is withholding and the other person is bringing out everything, how are yes. they going to do it? You know, like I said before, um, in a home where the fear of God governs whatever they do, such a thing cannot happen. But where it is the other way around, like where you find that, uh, well, the people got married when they were not Christians, and uh, eventually one of them gave his or her life to Christ. Uh, such a thing could happen. And when that happens, what do you do? You follow it prayerfully. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do the best you can do faithfully, sincerely, from the bottom of your heart in fear of the Lord. Uh -huh. And uh, where you find that it is getting out of hand, it is necessary to see a counselor. Like uh, Dr. Sedgwick was saying yesterday, uh, it is good for every married couple to have a counselor, a family counselor. It's very important uh, because uh, you find that nobody knows it all. And uh, no matter how um, loaded somebody may be, there is always somebody he or she would listen to. And when both of you now have a responsible person, family that uh, is your family counselor, or I call it discipler, you go to them and uh, on such issues, they will put you right. Two, no two marriages can ever be the same. And uh, you find that some people will be, want to practice what they see some other people practicing. It's wrong. And what is the cause of that? Especially some women, you find that they have they keep a lot of friends 
Uh, I think I heard Sister Lizzie talking about your friendship outside the family. I don't believe in having friends outside the family. Your husband should be your best friend, your only friend, and uh, vice versa. And when that is so, you find that both of you will always confide in each other and do things as one man. But you find that where you are keeping friends outside, they will be counseling you on certain things and uh, things that are not true. And when you come to stop practicing it in your home, you are going to destroy your home. You need a counselor. So where you find that the other person is withholding and you are doing your best, continue to do your best and back it up with prayer. As a child of God, I tell you, if you go on your knees and cry to your father, say, Lord, I am doing this because of you, God will surely intervene. And there will be good uh, behavior, you know, uh, because uh, like Sister Lizzie was saying, when your husband sees the mark of Christ in you, I tell you the truth, is it, it, bound to surrender to Christ, uh, no matter how hard his heart may be. And then when you are doing that, and you know that person who he can listen to, who probably is your family counselor, tell him, honey, can we go and uh, see this person? It appears that, I don't even make it look as if uh, you are blaming him. Look, uh, it appears that uh, I'm not really uh, uh, doing what I'm supposed to do. I think I need some counseling outside our home from people who are mature counselors. Uh -huh. By the time you go there, a good uh, counselor who has the fear of God will see both of you down and tell both of you what are your respective responsibilities in the home. And you find that it will help a lot. So where there are counselors, where you have a good counselor, you find that uh, many people will not be going astray the way they do in marriage. Now, to talk about the second one, um, you're talking about tithing. Uh, like I said when I was talking, tithing is very good. But I want us to understand that tithing belongs to the Old Testament. Although this is a very controversial issue, so I don't even want to talk about it much. But if you read the Bible very well, that it is Old Testament. And even when it all started in Genesis chapter, I think, uh, I think chapter 13 or there about Abraham was coming from the Bible of the Chaldarama and uh, he met uh, Melchizedek and all those things. But if you see what transpired there, you find that it's not even the way they are constructing it today because our, our um, conventional uh, men of God today have now seen this as an avenue to make money. And that is what is going on. Like uh, the questioner rightly asked, you find that people tight and tight and tight and tight, and rather than be, being rich, they are getting poorer. But you see the man of God richer. That is not what the Bible teaches. If you see the Bible principle about tithing, you find that the Bible did not even talk much about tithing. Jesus Christ actually on one or two occasions talked about it when they confronted him with question. He said, this one you ought to do, but the other one you ought not to uh, 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 throw away. In which case, it is good. If tithing is the way the church sustains itself, please go ahead and do, and do it. But let me tell you, the way the Bible says we should uh, uh, support the church today, if you look at the New Testament, Jesus Christ never collected tithe from any man and he never paid. Neither did any of his disciples do. But what did the disciples practice after the departure of the Lord? The Bible says they brought, every man brought everything he has. Everything. This time, not 10%. That is talking about 10%, but 100%. And they dropped at the apostles' feet. And now every man got what he needed according to his need. That is the New Testament principle. And uh, when the church could no longer stay in one place and they scattered, the Bible now says every uh, Sunday upon the first day of the week, uh, every man should gather whatever he has and keep aside and uh, give according to what you have, not what you do not have. For God loves a cheerful giver. But what is uppermost in the heart of the Lord is the poor and needy. There are many poor and needy in the church. We see them every day. Our consent is to go and give to the man of God so that they will clap for you. But there are people, you see a brother sitting near you or a sister sitting near you. Last Sunday, she came with her one, car, one address. The other Sunday, he came with the same thing. Always, when they raise the armpit, they, it has changed color because of overwashing. It is not laid in your heart to help that person in one way or the other. You see people that are in different needs. The Lord says we should help such people. In the house of God, there is a need. You see people, they are asking the people to come and contribute money. 
You know that God has blessed you so much with money that you can now say, okay, man of God, don't worry. Rather than raising money to do this thing, uh, I can do it. Don't mention my name. And you come and do it. You spare other people the grief of uh, coming to drag them. What am I trying to say? It's good to tithe. If the only way they can tithe and they, they can uh, support the work of God is to tithe, please do it. I, I, I pay my tithe. But then I want to let you understand that uh, if anybody is trying to put a yoke on your neck by that, it's on biblical. If you go to New Testament, book of Hebrew, book of uh, Galatians, the Bible talks about the, uh, the doing away of the old law and uh, following the new law. And we are living under the new law. So in the church, uh, any man who tells you that uh, it is your tithe that will make you rich, the person is telling lies because Dan Gute would have been the greatest tither. Uh, but uh, Dan Gute knows nothing about tithing because he's not even a Christian. And uh, the poorest people in Nigeria today, with due respect, <laughs> you may find them in the church. And these may be faithful tithers. So it's not your tithe. It is good to uh, pay tithe. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a religious duty. But then your, your, your blessing, yes, Malachi chapter 3 said that uh, if you bring all the tithe, I will give you a blessing. Fine. Go and see what the Bible says also in the New Testament about helping the poor. Jesus Christ said, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink and all those things. Jesus Christ wants you to be your brother's keeper. He said that you should help everyone, especially those in the household of faith. So to round it up, Tithing is good. Uh, the Bible says you give what you have and what, not what you don't have. And that uh, in uh, give, promoting the work of God, you are not confined to 10%, but what you have. What you have is what you give for the work of God and give it faithfully, give it sincerely, not so that men will applaud you or clap for you. I remember one time in a church, uh, the man of God was asking people to come and sow seeds. Oh, yeah, 10,000, 100,000, 50,000. And the lady was uh, <laughs> there. At the end of the day, as we just uh, stepped out to go, I heard that grumbling. I said, uh, Madam, what's the problem? He said, I don't know this kind of thing. Eh? Every time they're just scheduling, like, making people to come and agree that, that the money she has pledged now, she doesn't know. How she, I said, Did they force you? He said, Ah, my brother, you don't understand now. If you don't give now, they will think that you are the poorest person. I said, No, nobody forces you. I say, the Bible wants you, God expects you to give what you have and not what you don't have. And the Bible says you should not be cajoled and that you should not do it to please men or to show off, but give it from a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Give what you have voluntarily and with the fear of God. Give it lovingly. Give it, you know, without, uh, I mean, any cause, anyone coercing you. And that is when you receive blessings from God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I just want to add a few things, my sister, uh, concerning the issue of the woman that is planning to divorce the husband because he's not providing. I do not know if she's planning to remarry because when I meet young uh, couples and they're talking about divorce, I used to be, I am of the um, opinion that if you, are, if you divorce, you should not remarry mm -hmm. unless that's your spouse. Uh, passes away. That's the only ground you can remarry. So I always ask them, do you plan to remarry? And most times you see them getting agitated when I ask them. Because I say, if you plan to remarry, it's not of God. So it helps them to put things in perspective. And I'll just share um, a situation of a patient that I treated some years back. She complained of insomnia. She had seen psychiatrists, seen different doctors. She was hypertensive and so on. And she said she has stopped taking those drugs because she still could not sleep after being on those drugs for over a year. So I just went into something like cognitive behavioral therapy, trying to find out, I asked, are you under stress and so on? And as I just started probing, she started talking about the husband. The husband did not provide. The husband is not working. The husband is not, you know, just husband, husband, husband. So at the end, after she complained bitterly about the husband, I just asked her a simple question. Do you want God to take away the husband so that you become a widow? And she just said, no, she doesn't want that. So I said, the fact that the man is alive, he's standing there as husband. He may not be bringing any money, but he is there. And he's a father to the children. If you want to scold the children, he will also put his mouth. 
let's just just allow him to be hand him over to god since you are a resourceful woman continue use the children to do the work and at the end of the day god will deal with the husband in his own time just don't quarrel with him or don't begin to stress yourself because he's not providing so after talking i gave her something about how to sleep i have this sleep chart i use for patients with insomnia and all that then a few days late few weeks later i saw her in the church she was dressed smiling with a hat looking so beautiful i myself i was shocked and i said oh, how are you she said i'm sleeping very well now so that little counseling i gave her was what made the difference she has been on drugs but the bottom line is that she now found out that her happiness does not depend on the husband or what the husband is providing happiness depends on what god has given had the grace to sustain her. Mm. So for me, that's your uh, um, the person you said is thinking of divorce. Please, I would like you to advise her not to divorce and just continue to do her best. The most important thing is the life that God has given her. And then the issue of tithing, my own experience, I started tithing when I was in secondary school, when my pocket money was 50 kobo and my tithe was five kobo. That's when I started tithing. And I've been tithing since. But the way I have been blessed since I became National President of Medical Women's Association of Nigeria, it has been so phenomenal that I wonder, is it that I tithed more during this tenure or was it something extra that I have done? I have spent a lot of my personal money before and even during my tenure as President of the Medical Women's Association. But I have been blessed in ways that I never expected. So I just believe that sometimes certain situations, depending on how you give, the tithe is okay. And that one will rebuke the devourer and everything that comes with that. But there are certain situations you will be and the way you, you allow God to use you in those situations that will also bring other blessings that you did not expect. Mm -hmm. I hope this helps. Yes, thank you so much. That was All very right. good. So we'll we will quickly we will quickly uh, uh, go to the the last presentation, which is on children and the family, and we call on our deaconess Lizzie Oyema to wrap up our webinar with that presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, ma. Yeah. Uh, before I go on to talk about the children in the family, please, I would like to throw a little information about this title. Please, the titan we are talking about, because you are titan and you are not living the life, you will not get blessing. Titan is important. That uh, titan, you don't see any blessings, then check your Christian life. Check your, your relationship with God. Because in, from my own experience, when you tight, God will remove the vora and it can never be poor because of your titan. But the titan is not a yastic for heavenly race. Titan is just a command from God, I must do that and you have to obey it. But your Christian life needs to be checked, not just to, to obey Titan and disobey. This is a partial disobedience, it's total disobedience. Therefore, your Titan, and I have not seen any fruit, fruitfulness out of it. Check your source of income and your lifestyle. That will help us to go in Titan and get a good result uh, or good outcome of Titan. Thank you very much. So now we're going over to children in the family. Children in the family is a blessing. But let us not look at children alone because of marriage. We we'll look at God. Last time I was to talk about love. When I was about talking about love, I talked about I thought about uh, you first of all recognize God into the marriage. See God as the foundation of your marriage. Then when children begin to come, you know it's, it's the blessing of God. And you be in spirit to understand that it's God that sent the children, that we are just the caretaker and not the owner of the children. And caretaker must be careful because the owner of the region will come to question you. How you train the children, how the foundation you, you laid on the children, how you carry the children, how you have lived and give example to the children, God will ask you of them. That is why Bible says that you should turn off a child in the way you should go. So when you come of age, you will not depart from it. So children in the family need family of uh, Christian upbringing. Like what I told them in the church this morning when I was giving them talk in the church, said that revival should start from home. Revival in the home makes children to live healthy and happy, happily in the society. So when you're talking about children, you, the husband and wife, you have to come together and be one first to be able to take care of these children. 
because they, you are just caretaker. The owner is watching the way you are bringing these children. The impact you are making in the life of the children is very, very essential. That's why the Bible said that children in a marriage are the physical product of oneness as proposed by God for the refreshment of the health. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. If God gave you these children in order to feed the health, and not that you, they are your own. Yes, they are answering your name, but God is in charge. They send, God sent them to the earth just as you were sent to the earth. So, but you, that is in custody of these children, need to train them in, in God-fearing way. So that when they come of age, they will not be a problem to the society, to the body of Christ, and to you as, as well. The children are blessings from God, just as it's written in the book of Proverbs chapter 10, to say the blessings of God make it rich and add no atom of sorrow. So by the time you follow God in God's way, you will see your children, none of them will bring you pains at old age. None of them will bring you no know, reproach at old age because he's laid a very good foundation. Others used to say that feed a goat very well. Anywhere the goat goes, you must come back to eat well because you know that is the source of feeding well. So if you give a child a good training, anywhere the child goes, he will represent the family very well. The family name will not be mis uh, misused. The children are um, blessings from God for the Lord. Therefore, their upbringing by parents should not be regarded as a burden, but should be, a, a should be faced with uh, the joy of the Lord. This is why couples should limit their offering to what they can cater for. You know, you have to check your marriage. In a, like the previous time we were discussing the last lesson, we said in agreement, I agree on the number of children you're able to rear. Is it two children or one or four? That based your, on your income, so that you will not bring up children to the earth and look upon another person to train them for you. It is disheartening. It's important that you train the children within your income. And also, when you are training children, check your income. Don't give them hope against hope. When you see children, other children wearing expensive wears, do not go to, for those expensive wear to, for the children. Because a time will come, the children will not like to go for any type of dress unless the ones you have given them. Teach the children to be contented with whatever they have, what the family has, not you going to live above your income because you want to please their children. No, not at all. So most of the way we are coming back from church, we are seeing parents buying children ice cream here and there. It's good that you are taking care of buying them all those things from church as if there's no food in the house. Giving them all those things is good. What of a day that you may not have money to buy? There was a day a child was crying. I asked the mother, what is the problem? He said, eh, he's asking for ice cream. I said, I'll be buying ice cream. So I said, why are you not buying it? He said, because I have no money. I said, ah, you have you have better something you cannot uh, continue. So give them training that you can every time you're able to meet up. And that's another one is that as God starts to bless you with children, you have the responsibility as commanded by God to train them up your, way, uh, your children, train up your children early enough. Give them the real foundation. Anything that the you know, children learn from, from infants, even for the womb. I keep telling them from experience. I talk to my children from the womb. Train them. The womb. They are living. When the parents, when they are pregnant, whatever they see, they eat, they, they beg, eat. You have children, the child is learning, but by the time the child comes up, he's beginning to eat that form. So control your eating, control the child in the womb. When the child is born, the child will follow suit. And not, not all, everything the child cries for, you give to the child. No, you are telling the child that life is easy to get. Let them know that his life is not as rosy as they think. Give them what they can offer, and not what they cannot offer, you should not go for that because you want to please the children. Not do that at all. In the fear of the Lord, you have to train them. Fear of God. Say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's interesting to have children that have wisdom. So but they have to fear God. When they fear God, that is the beginning of their understanding of way of life. They will not give it praise and they will fear God anywhere they go, even in the higher system. And when they go, they will not depart from it. They will not depart from trusting because the fear of God is already in them. Whatever you have, children came to on earth here. Just to have nothing of the child when he came in. But it's the environment that rise what becomes of the child. What you give to the child will become of the child. If you train the child in the way what you're teaching the child how to tell lies against their husband or against their, yourself, when it comes of the child, will tell lies against you too. 
We even was fighting, selling lies, because you see, that is the practice they do in the house. I am sleeping in the house. You tell them their mom is not at home or that is not at home. We are teaching them that it's possible to lie. And no lie is little before God. All lies are liars. So it's better not practice it at all or impart it to the children. Because children learn negative things fast. When anything negative is easier to impart. But when you, when you present good things always, positivity every time, it becomes of the child. Because the child is brought up in an environment that is decent and God-fearing environment. He will never do it. Even when it's in the midst of other children that were brought in a horrible home, in a wrong foundation, he will not do that. He will, even when he's tempted, he will remember where he's coming or he or she is coming from and, be, and, be, and stay aside. He will, he, will, he will stand out of the environment. It's not Christian or God-fearing environment. Then make sure that children keep to the God's principle, kingdom principle. Fear your mother, honor your parents so that with a condition, honor your father and your mother so that you will live long. Teach them the way to honor you, but not rebooking them harshly. Me, I, I, I am a, a matter of correcting children. I use cane, I use cane to flog them, but I show them love more and let them know why I treated them that form and they will never repeat it. Like when they were coming up little children, they always come to the kitchen. Come to my kitchen every time, struggling with a stove. Right then I used to use stove in cooking. What I said, uh, I've been trying to correct them. If you remove them from the kitchen, they will go, they will crawl to the kitchen. So the child, what I usually do, when there's kettle on the fire, I'll bring them near, we use their hand, touch kettle, it will hurt them. They will not know that there's danger in the kitchen. They will never temper coming closer to the kitchen, whether you are there or not. So show the children implication of what they are doing. If you do this, this is a repercussion, either negative or positive. You have to educate them. Then they will not love to go for those things that are negative that will give them negative uh, uh, reflection. They will go for things that will pleasing them and pleasing the family. Very essential. As children are born into a sinful world, it is the duty of parents to train them up in the fear of God, in the fear of God, which is the foundation of wisdom and knowledge. I've, I've, been say, I've said this. Fear is that when a child is born, no, he knows nothing of this earth. It's entirely in a, a, a different world where, from where he came from. Then you have to pat, pattern the child in a way that he will grow. And he will, he, the child will be useful to himself, to the society, and to you as well. It's the fear of God. Teach them. Give them Christian novels to read. Check what they read. Because what they read becomes of them. The music they listen becomes of them. The friends they keep before, becomes of them. So watch them day in and day out. Make friends with them. You can make, like my daughter, I do have my bath with my daughter, when, the only girl I had. This, I, I taught her how to bathe, how to clean up. We enter bathroom, we bathe together. Make sure that the child comes of age and you know, you will know the life to follow. You will not disobey. You will not give you stress in this season. And that one is training a child how to, how to, how to, how to read the scripture very early. Every word in the Bible, teach them that the word of God is God himself. As you read it, you become more fit. Because if any novel you read, you see a child that reads uh, all these um, uh, uh, James Hadley Chase and all these words, they, they behave like that because it is coming into them. You see the film you are watching, if you are watching Z word or all these things, you see the behavior coming gradually into you because what is this thing goes into you and manifests in, in, from you. So it's better you check the children, check the novels you read, Check the films they watch. Check the chatting chat they make. That it will help them a lot. And most often, children introduce them, their children into phone, having from when they are yet matured. Say because eh, why am I doing that? So anywhere I am, I yes, let me be connected to them. I know where they are. Do you know the child will be in the house and he's not in the house because of phone. He's in the house. My child doesn't go out, but he's using phone to do many things, do connections outside there. I'm not disputing the fact that they're giving phone. Yeah, good, they are giving. But be careful and thought, teach them not to go astray with phone, the kind of friend they keep. When they go to school, they copy different numbers, they call home and be talking, and you wouldn't know. So that's another disadvantage of this phone. Anything that has advantage has disadvantage. So issue of the phone, we have to be very careful and caution. Still teach them the way to use it so that they will not go astray because of the phone. Most often, the, the children will go into chatting early stage. We give them all this uh, hand drive phone. They will, instead of them, children learn fast. They are very, very intelligent. They learn fast. It's very negatively. They will go into horror films, uh, chat a page, website, and be watching films that you ought, they ought not to see and seeing things that they ought not to know. 
So better don't give them hand drive phone. What did you give them all these toy phones? I know they will still use to communicate as I bet that would be better than what they see and watch in the handset. Because all those uh, touch lights like uh, Nokia and all those local small ones that cannot handle, they will not have access to all this worldly website to watch what is going there. It is important. It is necessary to it's necessary to consider and decide on the following uh, prayerfully. One, the number of children and their spacing by family planning. You and your husband have to come together to think of the family plan, how, whether you are going to go on family plan of two, three years or three, three years interval. Mine was three, three years interval. So you think of what to do so that uh, you, you will space as children, two of you will come in agreement that uh, yes, we will have two children. The first one, when the first one will be maybe one year, we can come, we can think of having another one or two years, we can think of having another one, depending on your income and the strength and health of the woman as well, because that is essential. And I've got to have to talk of some women for years, the man for years, no issue. That has been a general issue, problem breaking homes without um, understanding that it's God that gives children and not man. If the man is is, 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 is not uh, productive, you have to bear. If the woman is not, you have to bear. But there's another way out. Another way out is either you adopt a child, and, and some churches don't have accept this uh, IV, something you do, plantation. But you have to find a way to have a child, adopt other children. Bible said, you that is barren, be your tent, extend your tent for the children of the of the disorders, so you can accommodate them. Make open your home, your home of other children. Then they make them your children. That will cover it. Ask for what we need. Somebody to call you mommy and daddy. Somebody that you can you can call upon at any time and send an errand. That is all about children. The children, you take them as their biological child. Then train them and make up their life. And the ultimate in marriage is love. God is love and it has to be ultimate, not child. Don't go into marriage like the first talk I gave in uh, loving one another. Don't marry because you want to have children. Because whereby children are no more coming, the marriage will break. They marry because of love. God has ordained the marriage. Even whether with child or without child, you'll be comfortable and keep loving each other. It's far up. Two, choice of sex. The two of you should choose. Either it's uh, male or female. But it's your, remember, when you're choosing, remember you're not God. You will not be there when God will be sent, molding the child, sending the child to the body to come up. You're not God. The choice of let the will of God be done. If it's there's no sex that is bad, female is very useful. It's gone at the days. They say, ah, I found, I found let me look for my name will not lost. Let me look for a boy that will answer my name. No, uh, you begin to look out to make a, to have female uh, male child because her wife has given to female children. It's an error. Now, female children are very close to fathers now. They care for the home, not fathers, even to mothers. They care for all of them. They come closer. They, they care for one another. They even remember more than the male children. So you can see that both of them are useful. Depends on the relationship I've established between you and the children. So agreeing on the sex that you are going to take, uh, I don't think it's important in marriage. For me, what is important in marriage is love. In every situation, you remain in love. In health situation, you remain in love. In childlessness, in situation, you remain in love. In a financial lack of financial uh, capability, you display, stay in love. Every situation, once the love has been uh, no, no, has become intact, you, are, you love one another strictly. Nothing will shake you. Nothing. Will, you will not seek anything. But you have motive. If you have already had motive of marrying, I want to marry this man because he's rich. When the wealth visits the way, money has has win. That you are rich now may not be that you remain rich forever. A time will come, you may not have those things again. What will happen? Maybe a man was is working like example that the COVID gave. A man was working, the wife was not working. You know what it is. So if the other one stopped working, what happened? But the man, when the work of that man stopped, what will he do? The love will decline. They look up for that man who is buying. No. Marry because God has ordained your marriage and you love the man, whether good or bad. For better, for worse, you remain. So, choice of children shouldn't be something that will bring issue in marriage. This can be approached by prayer or faith, if at all. You have to pray and yet God give you the other one and saw what you expected. I said it in good faith because the will of God is always what we expect to be, to be done in our lives. When the will of God has been done, 
we begin to think otherwise. Do not help God in any situation. The only help you need to help give to God is believing in God and live godly life. That is that's God. In the, um, because this is said that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and depart from her iniquity. You, you understand? So you not think of any, how to help God. God is there to do everything. No one can help God. If you want to help God, you go according to you go against the will of God. You go against the principle of God. Therefore, read the scripture as I, I keep saying. Read the Bible because the word you are speaking is life and power. It has everything to do in your life. Without it, you cannot get anything. Without the word of God, no one can be a Christian. It's the word of God that is portraying us to the life we are living. You know, the word of God is, is, is the mirror that we are seeing through. The word of God is the encouragement that we are having to move on, even in a very difficult situation. When you remember the word of God, you, you forge ahead the, like a child moving with the father. There was a father ahead. A child was going with the father. The father was going, he said, Daddy, where are we going to? He said, Don't worry. We'll get there. After some time, he said, Daddy, where are you going? I said, Dad, don't worry, God is in control. The, after some time, the child stopped asking the father. But the father now asked, Why are you why are you no longer asking questions of our movement? He said, ah, Daddy, because I know you've told me that God is in control. So I, it's not in your power. So when you are teaching, you know, children are very inquisitive, some children to know everything. So when you want to answer their question, pattern is go use the word of God to bring it up and answer them, and it will stick. Memory, they will never go astray. There should be no discrimination of sex, just as I've said before. The gift of a child is the is, is from God. You know, God gives us everything. However, one choice is not made. Do not kill yourself. But however, if your choice is not made, let the will of God be done. One should not grumble over a female. I have a, I had an experience, a woman, a colleague of mine in the office, every time. The man, the woman gave birth to three female children. The man was not happy. So, but he said, after these three children, that's all. We agreed for three children. We are no longer going to be, uh, have any child anymore. So, this, this lady came to me. I said, okay, since the husband has said, it's an agreement. People agree three children, and the three are female. They are all children. Have them in good faith and begin to live. Then later, I think after a few years, this woman, mistakenly took in the man was angry he said want to give birth to a female child again that is tired we were agreed on three no need of going for another child go and abort it and they are christian so so go and abort it the woman came to me i was in school when i came down he rushed to me say come please my sister you are the only person i can find in and you are the only person who can give me advice the will of god you know the will of god is not a will of man it's a mystery no man can attest it so when, after the woman has explained everything, he said, uh, you, are you pregnant? He said, and the husband is telling me to, uh, telling her to go and abort it. But they do not go and abort this pregnancy. If it means you going back to your family to give birth, after giving birth, you come back to your husband's house. Or you can come to my house and give birth. After giving birth, I will take the child if it's female. If he say, well, I will take, I will train. Because I am very good in training other people's children. That the cobra can attest to that. So don't worry about it. The woman said, eh, he said, but don't quarrel with your husband. As he's rebuking you, be calm, be prayerful. Go closer to your God. This is the hour for you to seek the face of God in every situation. To cut the long story short, do you know when the woman gave birth? He gave birth to a baby boy. Just a replicant of the father. Then the father now named, named him Afa Mefuna. You can imagine. When I came to the clinic, I said, ah, no, 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 no. This is my child. I will, you know, it's God sent. What the names of the name of this boy is God sent. So I'm taking the child to my house. You've gotten the number of children you want. The man knelt and said, "Please let the bygone be bygone. Let not this thing be occur again in our spirit mind." That is just, for instance, for family planning. We have to, just have to be very careful the way we talk of family planning because the will of God is always there. Seek the face of God in everything you are doing. Do not take a panacea in your life, in your marriage. Let God have final say of everything in your marriage. You will see a marriage running smoothly. But are you family planning, by chance, if family planning may fail you, then take it in good faith. Nothing will happen. Somebody was, was in the same faith, in the same church with me, because I born again. The, the, the last one was about seven years, and I've closed everything. I've closed everything, and they are guests, guests. This is not the only boy has, it, it was a uh, <laughs> the, the man said, no. 
He was an old. How can I be pregnant at this old age? I'm ashamed of myself. He was really worried, not even your husband this time. So the, man, the woman came to me for counseling. I told the woman, God has a purpose for sending this child to you at this very old age. You don't know what, what, what will happen in future. So have this child God has sent to you. Maybe this child will make the salvation of your home to be well organized and solidified. And may this child has a role to play in the kingdom of God and he decide to uh, terminate the pregnancy and this of the child will go. Please allow the child to come. He said, what of the child? Say, if anybody wants to gossip you, after six months, you tell anybody that, yes, this person is pregnant. He said, I, I, I've heard of it too. It will no longer be a need. Is it to please man and please God? What do you intend to do? What in attempt, in attempt to abort the child, you die? What will be her fate at old age? So this man here to my advice. And when she get to bed, what did she give? She gave birth to a baby boy, having two boys. While the first boy was already in uh, Guashiku Polytechnic. Do you know in the process, much later in life, that one in Polytechnic died by motor accident. That means that he would have had, because the boy was about entering court or began waywardly, uncontrollable uh, variables entered the boy's system. So what the boy, you know, the, the child now that came, another boy, became an encouragement to the mother, say, thank God, even when I came, met her crying. You might say, thank God, mommy Lizzie, you are my God. You know, you, you've received this. You asked him to leave the child. He began to confess, and I heard that man not to re, 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 rewind what has happened in the past. So you can see the instance that God has a plan. He's a master planner. Everything about God is perfect. So he has already known that this boy, the, the, the senior boy may not live longer because of the trial, and he will not be able to withstand the, the, the trial ahead, ahead of him. And this boy died by motor accident. And this boy, the, the last one that he gave birth at a very good old age, is not the boy, the boy, a male child among the female children in the family. So that is the will of God. God sees ahead of us. He knows everything. He knows our tomorrow and yet years to come. He knows our beginning to the end. So we, will always, we should always go to him to seek his mind and let his mind be always be done in our life. It's very, very essential in our life. Do not segregate, do not discriminate. It is noted that many men blame their wives for bearing only one sex. Doctors, I can't teach you this much because it's your field. You know, you know that many men are always against, just as I've given an example, because I, I, I need a, a male child, I need a male child, I need a boy to represent me. I, when I've gone, I need these children would marry. And, no. Calm down. It's not your duty to be checked for God. Let the will of God be done. The sex, at times, you see them fighting their wives. Uh, hey, you have given birth to a baby girl again. It's what you give that you receive. What a man plant, a plant, so shall he reap. It's not the fault of the woman. It's what the woman has, the man has deposited that becomes of the woman, and that's what the woman will produce. Then you, you they stop saying that, yes, the fault is for the woman. And let me go out to look for another woman who give me male child. It's an error. I've seen a man who went outside to look for, for male child. They want us to get more of get female children. So what do you say in this situation? You, call, you will leave that one and go to another one. He began to change women from time to time. Before you know, you, you fall out of faith. The only thing is you appreciate what God has given to you. And he will do more. It, it's very important. I appreciate for you. you consider too, you are talking about saying, what of God that, does not, that, that not, does not have a child? They haven't gotten a child for 15 years, 20 years, 25 years of marriage. No issue. You that God has blessed with a sex, you are, you are dying because a particular sex is not given. You are, you are just being ungrateful and not reasonable at all. It is, then they begin to say, get, whether it's female or not, the only one sex, e.g. sex, uh, cis females in a successful uh, marriage, in a succession of marriage is wrong. You, you should not think anything. You have gotten all to cis females. You are blessed. Any woman that has up to a uh, number of female, female this present day, you are blessed. Are, you are sorry lost automatically because it's your son. And if you have uh, male children all through, you are daughter-in-law daughter, uh, daughter -in -law to become your, your daughter. What else are you cleaning yourself for? It's okay. The God who made them knows how to balance the equation for you. So it's not your duty to tell God what to do for you. The, uh, how, how he will do it. He can, make, he can place a demand to God. And that demand is not what God wants for you. You can't change the mind of God. His mind of God must be say, I bless whom I want to bless. That's all. So he has said to bless you with female children. You shouldn't question God. 
why did he give it to their children? You sh- sh- when you do that, you will be ungrateful to God because some are still looking, at least let me have a, a child, whether male or female. Have that in your mind. It's very, very important. One more thing that you remember in a sex setting, female, uh, what uh, the sex medically, it is proved medically that the sex determining factors is the fastest or smartest type of uh, sperm, uh, either the Y or X. And that was why I said I'm not going to talk much on this because that's your field, male or female type that goes into the, the fallopian tube to fertilize the ovum. So you should know this, that is either Y or X goes into the, uh, the, the fallopian tube to fertilize the, the, the ovum. Therefore, you should not think that the fault is from one person. It's not from the man, neither from the woman. Is the will of God. It's nature. Nature brought about it. What you have in your system that is deposited. What the man has that deposited into the woman becomes of the woman. Therefore, the, the male or female type that goes into the biological to, to fertilize the ovum. The woman's, that is the woman. That determines the male or female child. That is what forms the child. The woman's ovum is always one type. X and X, female. It's always the one, one type, X and S, female. It is the man that has male or female. So X or Y seeks to give out to the woman for fertilization. So no man should blame or grudge his wife for what he or she, what she is not liable for. The husband only reads what she, he sold, just as I said before now. So it's not issue of... Uh, uh, my wife, the woman I have, is having a female children. No, you talk, both of you are having female children. Accept the, the condition in good faith because they are from God. Children came from God, not from man. Anybody tell you to come, let us go. I know somebody who will make medicine for you to have male children. You're only going to free yourself in an attempt to see yourself shutting your life and fall out of faith. You all depend on God in everything. It will help you a lot. Discipline of children. Let us look at discipline of children. Use the rod to correct your child because of the love you have for him. In the Proverbs chapter 13, 24, it says that you spare the rod and you spoil the child. When you use the rod, you deliver the child from hair. But when you, when you spare the rod, you send the child to hair. You correct the child, flog the child. In these modern days, you, you know, they no longer flog children in school. Even at home, when you, when you book a child and flog, it becomes an issue. Because child abuse, not so. You flow with love, is to correct. Myself, I flog my children with wire. After flogging them, I'll call them down. We we'll become friends and I'll let them know why I flogged them. Be hot and cold for your children. Not cold or true, and not hot or true. It will help to grow. Then he said, uh, this, this, uh, discipline your child early enough from a very tender age. Apply the rod to prevent him from, him, uh, from handling his heart. I was in the question last time. I saw a woman, when they were sharing wine, hot wine, alcoholic wine. Then the, when they got our, our set, the woman collected, said, please give to my son. The son is just best five years old. Say give to him, he's a man, future man to be. He let him get used to it now. I said, madam, what are you doing? I trained a child to take alcohol at the age of five because he's a male child. You are destroying the future of this woman, this child. He said, no, madam, you will not understand. Have you been to higher institution? I laughed. Everybody there laughed at that because they know I'm a lecturer in higher institution. If you go to a higher institution and see what is happening, so you better train the child very well now so that when you enter higher institution, it will not be a new thing. You will be adjusted and follow them. No? Is that a good training? Not at all. So teach a child early enough how to live life. And alcohol is not good for a child. Don't train the child to be addicted to alcohol. When you come of age, it becomes difficult for you to control. Even your mother, you as mother will not be happy. Apply law to prevent him from hiding a heart. Threaten the child most often so that you will not be hiding. So when you apply law, fear will come in. Just as I gave the example of my children, going to the kitchen, I use their hand to touch out the kettle. It will, burn, it will hurt them, but it will not burn them. Next time they won't near kettle at all. But if I allow the child to be going to the kitchen, one day we drag the kettle or pot of soup, it will fall upon the child. So at that tender age, they understand that there's um, 
Then they are in the kitchen. Therefore, they shouldn't cross in the area. Teach them early. Children learn early. And they learn a lot very early. So it's at that early stage to show them the way of God. Even in early morning, you want to pray, you want to have morning devotion. Don't say that it's a little child. What does he know? Wake the, wake the child up. Bring the child to the, uh, to the to the um, your morning devotion venue and pray with make the child to follow. Teach the child how to clap when praising God. The child is coming of age. When they are reading Bible, the child should listen. From time to time, you begin to read early enough. Don't wait on the child is up, is mature, they can't bend. Okra that is, has already gone up. To bend the okra becomes very difficult. So when the child comes of age, it's difficult. Some parents at home, you see, you, you allow your children to do anyhow, whatever they like. But when you take a child, the child out to, the, to another occasion, you expect the child to behave gently. Why you have not imparted that uh, gentle behavior into the child? It's an error. You cannot uh, be what you are, you are, you are not taught. It's what you are taught that will become of you. Therefore, train the children so that in any occasion they will represent, they will be comported according to the upbringing, according to the principle of God, according to the way God wants this children to be. Do not destroy the destiny of these children by misleading them through wrong training. It is very important. The, 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 another one, you, should, you will save this child from being destroyed early enough. When you give such destruction, uh, such training to children, it will prevent the children from destruction. It will help a lot. Don't withhold correction with the rod from your child. In Proverbs 23, I've said it before, 13 to 14, do not withhold any correction. Teach them early enough to know, that, to know good or bad. Let them know on time. Know the implication. When you say, tell a child that this thing is bad, let the child know why it is bad. Don't just tell the child, don't do this. Let the child know why it is bad. In terms of sex, if it's of age, you know what is called sex. Teach the child that once you meet another man, you're a female child, teach the child that when you meet a person sex and have anything contrary to the will of God or you fornicate, you will become, you will become pregnant and your future will be destroyed. This young boy will go, go ahead and begin to grow, be what you want to be in life. And your child, their future will be deterred because of this, avoid because of uh, rough training. So teach the child in, in early enough to know why it should not go into closer private place with a, an opposite set. Anything you want this child not to do, tell the child the implication of that thing, why you, you, he or she shouldn't do it. Don't just tell the child, do not do it. No. Let the child know why he should not do it. And the one you ask the child to do, let the child know the reason behind it. When they know the reasons, they will not do it when you're not there. But if they don't know the reason, when you're not there, they will do it. But if once they know, they will never, because the implication may be very horrible to them. Carrying your child with a reproof give a, gives, carrying your child with a reproof gives him a wisdom and discipline. But if left to misbehave, he will bring shame to him himself and to his family, just as I've said before. If you are killing your child, you no know, correcting the child in love, not in hatred. Both you and your husband, join hand, not on you alone. Both of you should correct each other, not when uh, that is not at home. The children behave anyhow because mommy will not have say. Or when mommy is not at home, children begin to behave contrary because no one will have say. That thing is said that this is the principle of the home, should be principle of, should, uh, should abide on every child in that home. Nobody should disorganize it. When my children were coming up, I never allowed them to go out, to go into anybody's flat when we were living in the compound. And they come of age. Even now, they don't even move out to go to people's uh, flat or visitation because they, that was the way they were brought up. They are careful in making friends. It is very, very important to impart positively into the children when they are very tender. Don't wait on their of age because learning starts from cradle, even from home. When they're of age, it's to be very difficult. Our uh, people say you do not learn how to use left hand at a very good age, old age. You learn it, you, when you started from cradle, you cannot depart from it. But when you're old, you can't say, let me write with left hand. You will not get a perfect handwriting. So you cannot make a child to change to become good. It takes only the grace of God for a child to come across a decent family that will, that will influence his, his, uh, his life. I have an example of that. A child that was brought up from a family, the, a family of nine children. Out of the nine children, she is the only girl in that family. So she decided, both the father and the mother, they fight every morning before going to farm. When they come back in the evening, they fight. 
So when these boys came of age, they, 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 they fight with their wives. They married and they fight with their wives. So this girl happened to live with the first son and the, the first son of the family. And the wife, the, the first son of the family and the husband always fight. Then this girl made up her mind. She made up her mind and said, that, no, in my life, I will not marry so that nobody will beat me. If this is what marriage is all about, I will never think of marriage. You see, environment, what has, what has caused to this girl, it is sent into this girl's memory that marriage is all about fighting and beating. There's no love. So in the course of you know, evangelism and preaching, we came across this girl. She gave her life to Christ and began to attend church and see another version of life altogether. Then the, the, the brother drove her out of the house. Why is she choosing to follow only Jesus can save? So when he drove her out, what did I do? I accommodated this girl. She began to live with us. So one day she called. He said, is daddy your brother? I said, no, it's my husband. He said, it's a lie. Why is that daddy doesn't beat you? I said, no, we're not meant to be beating each other. We are meant to love one another. That was why, where she opened up to, to direct her experience from her parents to her brothers. So you see what the environment can cause. So God be the glory. Her, her understanding decided to have to change because the environment has changed. She's married with children today, living in Lagos. So it's a testimony. Environment can play a vital role on a child. Environment matters a lot. So know the kind of environment where you take your children to. Do not take your children to a place to drink where you see girls half naked and here and there. They are learning a lot. They may come home and be behaving, you know, baby, my mother, uh, baby child, mother's baby, daddy's baby. But those things that are seen there, they learn by seeing. Children learn by seeing and doing. They learn fast. That thing they speak goes into their, you know, their, their memory and remain there. So it is important to, uh, to know the occasion to oh, take your children. Hello? Don't take your children to occasion where, where the, the, the negative things are being practiced. You see people kissing, they're dancing and romancing. It's not a good outing. The, the outing you can take your children is Christian outing, where they're doing birthday, Christian birthday, you no, know, doing other wedding and the rest of them. You can take them out to see what life is all about. But taking them to club and the rest of them is a very bad training. Do not do that. Caution. Caution in discipline. Parents should not keep on scolding, nagging, or discouraging their children, making them angry or re uh, resentful. No, it's not only bad, bad, bad we're showing the children. Make friends with your children. Make them your friend, best friend. And don't discriminate among your children. They don't say that this is my best child. No, you don't know the one that will be useful. A child goes to school and is not able to meet up. See, check spiritual life. Maybe there's evil forces making this child not to follow. Or there's no, there's no disappointment in delay because they must come up for something. Maybe God wants that child to delay a little to overcome the evil that would have dealt with him in the society where he graduates partly. Many things could be happen, could, could be possible. Maybe God wants it that way. That's anything that happened to a child of God is the will of God. That your son, maybe God forbid, becomes a dropout from school. Do not scold that child. Do not kill the moral. Do not reduce the, the child simply because he dropped out. That's not the end of life. There must be something wrong somewhere. Bring the child nearer and give the child good counseling. Show love. Do not throw the child. They say, don't throw bad water with bad child. Bring the child. Irrespective of the expenses you have done, wasted uh, money on the child, bring the child back because money cannot buy that child. Now remove him, talk to him, show him love. After some time, he will see his mate that we are in the same class with him, doing well. He will be forced to go back to school. We don't pray to have such child in our life, but if it happens, you, should not, you shouldn't condemn the child. Still show love to the child. You see your child both father and mother. And but father should not blame the mother. You are the cause of this. Neither will mother blame the father. You are the cause of this. It, it, in, that, in that situation, it always occurs when a mother is always at the forefront of covering the child from evil things the child is doing from childhood. A child will do bad, the mother will cover so that the father will not be. You are not helping the child. You are destroying the child. Father and mother should team up to give good upbringing to these children so that in, 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 at old age, you will not have any cause to regret. Even God will not question you. Because whatever you do to the children, God is watching. Whatever training, whatever impact you are giving to the children, God is watching. Teaching the children how to tell lies to their father. 
I know of a, a, a Christian mother. I know of that, that one very well. Paying school fees. The school fees of this child. It may be it's 30,000. The father is a busy type. He has no time to check whether it's 30,000 or not. The mother will come to say it's 50,000. You know how to make money. And it's all way. So why in the school, when they ask them, uh, they, they are going to pay school fees, maybe they, will, they are going to pay levy of uh, 10,000. The child will come home and say, mom, it's 15,000. Because mother has taught him how to influence it. It's not a good training. It is better you give the child the training that will, will be of great help. Make friends to the child. Let the child know that you love the child. Love your children. Fathers, love your children. Make good uh, use of your time on your children. Spend quality time with your children. Uh, be, uh, stray yourself to children. So give testimonies of life to your children so that they will not go astray. Because that's why I keep hammering about home revival. Revive your home with the word of God. And ho your home will be a peaceful home. If your home is peaceful, families are peaceful, church will be revived. It's very, very essential. Do not reject any child. Maybe because it's not fast learning. No. We have what is called introvert and extrovert. Some children, they are learning, accumulating, accumulating. And when they want to write, they're slow in writing. It affects them in writing. In education, there's something we call individual differences in children. As teacher, when you see them, you notice that this child is slow in learning. You give the child the opportunity to move up and uh, to meet up with others. How do you do that? Give the child constant draining. Teach the child how to write constantly. By so doing, the handwriting will improve. The writing speed will improve. It will help the child to meet up with the, the fast learners. Do not score the child because he's, uh, he does it, he's a lot of, he doesn't know anything. Don't ever use that because your word is, the, your mouth is meant to bless. You are blessed by the words of your mouth. Our mouth is meant to bless our children. And think positively and not negatively towards our children. Do not condemn any child. And do not compare your child with another child, another family. It's wrong. That's another one. Don't you see John? Yeah, your age may we are born. He's saying, what, look at what he's doing. Some parents have made their children to go astray. A, a boy that comes of age, he dropped out from school. He's not doing anything. He's bringing money, buying everything for, for, for you. Then you go and compare your child with that child, with that person. You will go to John to find out the source of John's sources. Then he will emulate and go astray. Maybe the destiny may not carry it. He will die on time. Do not compare your child with another child. Be, make your child to, be, to, to build up confidence in himself and be what God wants him to be in life. Let me tell you, we cannot change destiny. We can only help destiny. That's a fact. You can't change destiny, but you can only help her destiny. And nobody God has created to be useless in, in life. It's along the line. What happens in that person's this, uh, life counters with the destiny. At times, when the person comes back to God and realizes his or her mistakes, the destiny will pick out because he says his thought towards us is not for destruction. It's for good. That is God's way for us. But in world, it's the world that is the problem. When you come to the world, there are many issues, many challenges in the world that you cannot cope. It is time for you to focus on your child so that the world will not influence your child, but let the word of God influence your child, even when it's in the school. I have a child, a, a, a family. The child was in prayer band, coming, coming always, very hard working. When this child prays, God answers. But later, the, the, the family know that this girl was just waiting to enter high institution. Then when the child entered high institution, just the year one, first semester, this child began to wear jewelry that she had never, never wore before, bigger than those who had been wearing. The mistake she can stay from her father and identify her lips. Many things changed in that girl. When she came on holidays, she found it, difficult, found it very difficult to come for prayer band. I went visiting to ask why to leave that in. The parents said, that's where we are seeing it to. And since she entered university, she's no longer viable. I used to call her my prayer partner. What happened? The fault is from the parents. Do you know why the fault is from the parents? The parents did not expose the reason why those people shouldn't be like those children. If I told them the implication of, full, uh, of those, they love those, uh, those girls we are living, those things will not will have been enticing the child. He said, when sin enticing, you go out of there. So as I mean, you have told them, they educated this child that all these this, all this things are robbing, we attract men. We show them that you are valuable at every time, that you are mature for them to come and there, 
uh, rib. Therefore, this child will know, yes, let me keep myself for God. I'm focused. Mm. I don't mean, I'm, I don't condemn the sick, but I'm saying the implication of what it is as a single girl. You are telling them, yes, I can socialize, I can do anything. Why not be yourself the way God, nature has made it? That's why we say nature, nurture. You can be neat, you wear clean clothes, just as that the Koba said. You can wear clean clothes, meet up, be, be reasonable in the society. We, we educationists, we do not go for expensive things. We use, we use quality things with lesser income because we depend on salary. So you train the child how to be economical in living, not to, not to be very uh, extravagant in expenditure, how to manage money. Financial discipline is important, important to impart to the children. How to, not everything you see you buy. You do not go buy and regret whatever you bought because you buy with, uh, because I'm buying without plan. Plan before going to purchase. It helps you to grow. This is child, the CDC, you don't need it now. Yes, they are good, but you don't uh, need it now. When it is time, you will have it. And that child will now know that everything has time. You don't just go in to buy things because others are buying it. No, it is important for you to buy, to do things according to what is needed immediately. Scale of preference is important to train these children to know that what is called scale of preference. Scale of preference is not only in lifestyle, it's, to, it's also in, in terms of planning, benchmarking. Teach the child that is good. At this age, you should think of what you are going to be. At this age, this is what it ought to be. Teach the child that, and the child will work towards it. You will not have, you have a project at hand that, yes, I have to work on myself, that at this certain stage in life, I will be such a person. It will help you a lot. And it will help the family to grow very well. Very well. Praise thy Lord. Praise Master Jesus. Hallelujah. Use the rod on your child only for disobedience and the rebellion. Not for mistake. To avoid nervousness and timidity. If you keep beating the child, this beating the child using the rod every time. The child will be antisocial. The child will find it difficult to mix up with these people in the society, even in academics. Even when you want to do the right thing, you'll be scared that you don't know if I do this, my mother or my father will scold me or will use rod on me. Always let the children know when they're in the right. When they do the right thing, always praise them. Praise them, they appreciate them when they do the right thing and they would like to please you because you, they know they, you will appreciate when they do good. Not only scolding, scolding, scolding. At times, look at the good thing in that child and appreciate it and work on it. It will spring out by following the child judiciously. Do not just be shouting, shouting, rebuking the child always. Love is important. Do not making them angry always or resentful is wrong. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline, which the, the Lord Himself approves with suggestions of godly advice. You see, if a child, if you see a child that, that came from unhappy home, ungrateful home, always trouble, trouble, it's not hard to know. It's not hard to identify. When the child comes, everything around will be, will be irritating. She's the only person good. Every other person is bad. She does not appreciate anybody. And nothing comes that is, will be pleasing to this, such a child because it came from a background where no one appreciates. But if it's a family that is loving, caring, we would like to care. We would like to live in the life of giving. Seeing the child that parents give and parents know they welcome, they accommodate people, they spread those in the household of God. When the child comes of, of age, you, will, you have accommodation for others to come in. He will be loving, he will be appreciating others. It's a chain life. He begins to go like that. The child will grow up making good friends because he's, he's from a good home. And do not teach the child of borrowing. That is seen, I have no money. This I just borrowed this money. Then the child, it has come to the child's mind. Yes, I will, I mean, yes, it's possible to borrow. Even while in the school, he has seen it that borrowing is part of a life. So he went by the child that has not gotten money and parents will not provide. You go on what? Borrowing. And in attempt to borrow, there are certain borrowing that leads to stealing. So better teach the child not to borrow. You too, as a mother, live according to your income. Do not live above your income. Some persons, 
you see, you some of your, some of your classmates or your colleagues in the office are riding cars. Yes, cars is their priority. They want it, but their priorities in home it may not be car. Maybe the husband has, has earning higher, and the, himself is in a very high salary. You too, you are not earning as much as that. You come down. Don't compare your family with another family. I say life not to be competitive at all. Do not take life to be competitive or healthy rivalry. No, we are not in competition with anybody in life. Live according to our destiny and fashion your children to that line. They will be contented. They will be careful in every step they take. Do not go and make friends with somebody whose husband is rich, very rich, for each other to be collecting. In attempt to do so, you will come home with anger and not peace in the home. And you have a lot on the child on the on the children. It is better you, you stay at home and make Christian mothers their friend, those people that have gotten good experience in life. If I thought you must have friends. Me, I have everybody as friends, but I don't have a friend that I confine in. That is just the bent truth. Because the friend you have may betray you anytime. But God, make God your friend. Make your husband your friend. Make your children your friend. Make your children to be they're very close to you. Anywhere they are, they'll be eager to see you. If some parents will come and say, eh, my son, since he traveled, he has never called. It is the foundation that I've laid. That closeness was not there. Vacuum was created. He was too far from me. He was eager to leave the home. The home was not pleasing. Make your home a habitation, a habitable at home that the children can, will be eager to go home. The, life, the, lifestyle, the lifestyle of the home will be pleasing to the child. If you ever, ever want you to come home, anywhere, whether she's married to another family. Anytime you come, so we will enjoy home. And you will even carry the pattern to the husband's house. And the man will bring the pattern to his own home too, at Muna home. It helps a lot. And that will re reduce divorce. Children marry, they, they divorce because they don't know the meaning of marriage. Teach them early enough. That the choice you make, either make you or marry you, better you make choice prayerfully in terms of choosing a spouse, uh, choosing a life partner. Better go to God, do not go by his choice because your choice may fail you, but God's choice does, will never fail you. It is very important. Parents, another one, use the, uh, another one is that making the child to be timidity is another error. Do not allow your child to, be to, to look foolish, local in the, in the public because of the way you rebook the child. And one thing again, I, I have mentioned, I have to make sure it clear. Do not be a fault finder in the children always. Always find out the good thing that the children are very good at doing and appreciate them. That will set them up in doing good things. Make sure you have, you have first taught a child the correct way to do things and discipline him only if there is a, a deliberate habit to ignore your teaching and corrections. After I have taught them the right thing to do, and whoever they derail, you flog them and bring them back and reteach. They will come, they will be conscious of you. Do not expect the child to do correct things that you've not taught the child. No. It's what is in the child that becomes of the child. So impart positivity to the child, the child will be good. Wherever the child wants to go, because we cannot say devil is out of it. Devil will may like to pray some pranks with the child. Because a praying woman and a praying father, you go and kneel, the, the spirit that can go the child will depart. Unity prayer is important in the home. You can, whenever they, uh, they will dream, they will call you on phone, mommy, look at our dream, even if it's in the midnight, you pray with the children. I cannot wake up in the morning and wake up without having prayer with all my children. We link up. Yes, mobile phone has made things easy that you can connect your children and have unity prayer. After that prayer, prayers in the morning, it will guide the children all through the day. They will not go astray. It's very, very helpful. You decree it in on them. Give that word. My, there was a day my son called me. Mommy, mommy, I've been falling and shitting blood. I said, oh, I do have your water. They said, take it up. Pray. I just pray. Said, that water is not water. I turn to the blood of Jesus. That cleans everything. By faith, you need to have faith. That child, I said the faith of that child. He drank the water and the ceiling stopped. That's the belief. The ceiling stopped. Then the child, the next day, I said, go for checkup. When she got to the hospital, 
she was she was three, she was she, after checkup, nothing was found. She came back to tell mommy, I went to hospital, they said nothing. But I thank God I, I'm no longer feeling. You see what prayer can do. You have to teach the child that there's power in the word of God. That was why he called for prayer. If I've gone to a, a, a friend, the friend may think of another thing, give wrong treatment. So prayer is vital. Teach them on how to go on their needs, presenting their need to God and not man. Most often, let them know that you are, it's not a strength that you provide, but it's God that provides for them. Then they will always go to God, that, that God that provides for you, to provide more for, your, for you. Children pray for their parents, for provision. So when, 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 they, when they know that the God is the source of their income, they will always go to God in prayer to keep providing for their parents so that, that their upkeep will not be destructed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So do not deny your child food as a weapon of punishment, or you may tempt him to steal. Food is necessary. It's not like a woman you should not deny your husband says because of his uh, uh, mistake. You should not deny the, the, the man. Because when you deny the man of sex, you are tempting the man to go out. You are pushing him out from the marital home. So also when you deny a child of food because you want to serve as a, a deterrent to punish uh, to what he has done. The child will, will go astray, may go astray to steal in order to fulfill that hunger, to feed up the hunger. So you have heard what is happening now. People go to see because there's no food. You that have food in your house, you decided to you decide not to give your children food because or a child food because they are disobeyed. It's not the right thing. Give the child food. After food, you can lock up the child, beat the child up, and correct the child. So food, you deny the child food is not a good uh, discipline. Do not introduce that at all. It's not a good one. And that one is that in the, in the discipline of a child, parents should. Parents should um, be in agreement so, so as not to be not to get the child confused. No parent yes. should put the child the other child in bad light of by taking side. Do not hello, do not uh, take side, do not uh, discriminate in training the child. Do not take side when a child has done wrong. You cover up. I've said this thing before. Teach this child. Both of you, husband and wife, should join hand to correct the child. Not when the mother is rebuking the child, the father will be siding the child. He will see the mother as an enemy. And when the father is correct, the mother will, will, will be covering the child. He will begin to develop hatred for the father. No, it's an error. You are building a very bad seed into that child. What you need to do is for both of you to join hand and decide that this is the pattern of life we want to live. And this pattern of life we are living, we are passing to the children. We, we bring home principles. Like in terms of food, we have timetable in the home. If a child grew up to say that this is the food we eat in the morning, this one we eat in the afternoon, you will follow suit. Anywhere I am now, call my children, they will ask if with breakfast, the breakfast, the nature of the breakfast I'm going to have tomorrow. Because that is the system of the home. The home should have a system that runs in the home. So that when, when the child comes of age, you follow the system. You do not introduce system when the foundation has already been destroyed. So the five system helps to grow the, the family, even at a very good old age. Even when the children are out there, the system, the system will continue running. Praise thy Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. No parent, then the another parents should hold hands together in one accord by prayers to cast away any spirit of disobedience and rebellion from any child, showing these and other bad traits. I've said this thing before. At times, devil can like to we may like to play some pranks on the child. You and the mother can join hand in prayer to deliver this child from going astray. Do not condemn the child, but look at the power behind what is happening to the child. Look at what is responsible, and you correct it early. They say six in time, safe night. So we correct the child, call the child back, and correct the child. Not that a child still wants. You kill the child because he's a thief. Don't when anything that misses in the house, say you because I know you, you, you are the only person who can steal it. Then you have known I'm a thief, I will steal it. That's all. But when he sees that a child has gone astray, maybe he has the tempted to be stealing. Call the child out. Let the child know that stealing is 
Whereby that thing continues, because this day they're doing that. What you need to do, you go in prayer with your husband, pray of agreement. Every spirit in, that is in charge of it, in my child, making my child to sin, I cast it out of you. In prayer, use the God's, God's word to speak into the situation. That is why I, I keep on hammering that knowing the word of God, studying and becoming of the word of God is important because when you know the word, you don't want to apply at every point in time, in every situation. In that situation, you will see you say that God gives, make it rich, and add no atom of stone. God, this is not the child to me. Stealing is not of you. It's of the devil. Therefore, the devil that is responsible for this stealing, go out of this child. By so doing, this child will be delivered and become a good child. Do not help the devil to condemn the child. No. Do not condemn who God has not condemned. It's an error. You have to deliver the child because you are a caretaker. Praise thy Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Teaching of children. Teach your children the word of God daily. Teach them how to pray right from early time. It's essential for you to teach children on how to pray. Teach them early. Prayer is the key. I said it several before now. That is important to teach the children how to pray. If you teach them how to pray, the, the, anywhere they, they go, prayer will be the part of their life. Prayer all the time will be, will be the order of the day. If you hear them a lot. Like as it's written in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4 to 9, it's a lengthy reading. But let me give you a little verse of it. Praise the Lord. He said that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently. You have to teach your children diligently. Teach this word into the children, unto the children, and shall talk of them when thou sit them in the house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou listest, liest down, and when thou restest up, the word of God should be ordered of the day. As a mother, when you are moving, what goes to your straight mind? The word of God. The word that you have, this word becomes of you. Make, make, make sure you teach the children how to be past and past of the word of God. Tell them that the word is life. And it's life in everywhere you go. If you have the word of God in you, you will never go astray. God, anybody has dwelt in God has never been misled. Not at all. Just as we are talking of titles, some people are paying tight and they are still poor. Yes. It's not that you pay tight makes you to be rich. There are other ways. There's no man without problem. You may be rich, but you have a complex challenge in your life. No marriage that is 100% perfect. No family that's 100% perfect. But the little challenge is there, God takes control. If the man, if the man is, is, is if the family is paying tight and they're not growing rich, what of their health? They're healthy. No devourers through health. What of the children's academics? They are very intelligent in the school. So money is not all, all the things you, that makes one rich. You can be rich in spirit. The children are God fearing. You pay tight in all those ones. There are many areas that you get blessings from tightening and obeying God's instruction. There are a lot of them. Do not just depend that because you are paying that you want to write, I want to build house. No. Don't pay that for ulterior motive. Pay that because it's a command. When you pay, God knows the angle to, to bless you. And you did not, you did not direct God the angle to direct you because God knows what is good for you. God knows that when money comes, it's possible you go astray. Then we will turn the money and begin to train your children. I know of a woman very committed in things of God because she has no child. Every time sweeping the church will be the number one to come. Anything I do in the church, every time committed, showing love to the husband, doing everything. But lo and behold, God not bless her with a child. This lady, every time he will hire, I could not come for sleep, you know, you know, my child now, I must uh, clean up, I must bathe the child, it becomes an excuse. And that maybe that was why God was delaying from, for, for not giving her a child, delayed giving the child to the family. Because you know, the service of that woman was needed in his household. And when the child comes, it becomes a barrier, which is an error. When I noticed it, I called that woman, said, remember how much you were praying. For this child to come. Now, children are come now. You are now using them as an excuse for not coming to do the work of God in the house of God. Remember, it's an error. And she had to recount herself 
and come back, children you know, stop giving such excuses and began to be committed in the things of God. So also it happened to us. Maybe when the money must have come, the man will now go out. I've had a man say, yes, hey, when I was in money, I was telling many women, now, now that there's no money again, I am now my wife's husband. You see that kind of a thing. So it is better. God knows what is good for us and sure, that is just a short uh, conclusion of it. God knows how to bless us and the point to bless, to, the angle to bless us and at the point to bless us. That you, you, may, you may be very tight, our God, you may be serving God in everywhere and you are not rich. That does not mean that you are a sinner. No, not at all. That does not mean that God did not bless you. Look at the aspect that God has blessed you and you begin to appreciate God for that. All fingers are not equal. If God wanted everybody to be equal, he would have made all fingers to be equal. Therefore, look at it. That even that, that finger that is smallest, if they cut it off from your hand, you, you will no longer be able to use your hands effectively. So every finger has its own function. They are functional at its own uh, parts. It's just like when you're using computer. We have functional keys. We have uh, other general keys to operate. So you don't expect every key to operate the same thing. So also it is in our lives. God has placed us in a different category, blessing us in a different category. Like, like you see, most people that don't have money, they have more children. They take record of them. Majority of them, they are poor, but they make more children. One of my sister-in-law was having more children. That's the cousin to my husband. My people find it difficult to go and approach them. But I went to the woman and said, uh-uh, you've gotten up to 11 children. What are you, what are you doing? What, what is in your stomach? You say, I'm pregnant now. I say, why? He said, why am I asking that question? I, am, I didn't go to school. I am not working. I am not in business. But I'm into making children. So I have to do one to be to, to live. So you're not helping yourself. You have to think of how to bring up the children. At the end, he ended up in giving the children for herself, which is wrong. Do you understand? So maybe God has blessed her in the area of children, making children, making children. He continued to take it. So what I try to say, the area that God has blessed you, use it on your children. Use it on your children. Teach the children what is called contentment. You start teaching them how to fear God in their lifestyles. Teach them how to be close to God and let God dwell in them. Early enough, teach them the gospel. Read the scripture. As they come up, they should be reading it and you should be interpreting. After some time, ask them to interpret what they read and explain. We, we never depart from their memory. It will stick there. It's very, very important. <laughs> Do teach them how to play, how to pray right from early age. Expose your children to the gospel programs. Just I said this before. Expose them to gospel programs, not worldly programs. Because evil communication does what? Corrupt the good manners. Environment where you go becomes of you. The kind of song you sing becomes of you. The kind of music you play becomes of you. The kind of novel you read because of you. So it is essential for you to channel your children you know, into Christian programs so that they will become, they will learn more practically. Those things they see, when you expose them, they will become, they become part of them. Program in your local church from tender age. Teach them as early as possible. Some parents, when their children are tender, they wear them uh, uh, half naked wears. They are the innocent dressing. He said, baby, he said, baby. No, be teaching them. He said, he said, Ajabo, Ajabo, Ajabo. That kind of name. They give different names to a newborn baby. Teaching the child a wrong way. Bringing out with one that is, you don't know who has used it to flat the child's hair from childhood. We are into strange things on the child. You are invoking another spirit onto the child. You are invoking error into the child. Do not train them as the world is, but train them that they are in the world, but they are not, they are not of the world. Just as the book of John chapter 17, to, um, Jesus Christ stated that that was the word of God, Christ himself. So we, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. Therefore teach them. Those things that they see them, yes, it, 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 they are bound to happen. They are there, leave them. There's a way that seems right to a man. The end of it is what? Destruction. Teach them that early enough, that they should not be enticed by the way the world are going, but let them be engulfed by the way Christian brethren are going. The, the kingdom principle goes. Teach your children to pray, to pay tight. 
We said it before now. Teach them early enough how to pay tight. When you pay, when the children know how to pay that one little money they give them, they will grow off it. But this tight has a lot to do in the life of every believer, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. The only thing is that the ministers do not use the tithe according to the instruction in the book of Deuteronomy. So you pay tithe so that there will be enough meat in my house to so give to the widows, the less privileged ones, use it to take care of them. But none of them is being done. It's only that Can we, we round up? Can we round up? We spent more than one hour. We're supposed to round up. Okay, okay. Let me, I, I will still round up, please. Okay. People who trust in God should not entertain barrenness. Okay, I've, I've spoken on that one too. Any Christian who is pregnant must believe that her pregnancy will be carried to full age. Let no fear coming to threaten your marriage. It's wrong. Do not think of that at all. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So we have spoken on the circumcision before. I don't think I'll go into it. The circumcision of male child is important. No, no tradition that we ever make it to circumcise a female child. It is important. In conclusion, children raised in a loving and God-fearing environment often exhibit impressive and positive behavioral pattern in the society. Love equips children for the future and enhances their, personal, their personalities and spiritual development. It is very, very important to train the children in fear of God because it patterns them into God's way, even when you are not there. Even when you as parents are no more, their life will be in the pattern of Christ and they will not derail. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Deaconess Lizzie Oyema, for the exposition on children in the family. I know that it is because of the importance of this topic. That is why you have gone in, in, into detail because the other presentations you gave, you did not go in as much detail. And we want to appreciate that. However, we have overshot our time by one hour. So we'll not be able to take any question. What we are going to do now is to wrap up with a closing prayer by our national coordinator. But I want to remind us that we are seeking volunteers for marriage counseling. You can see from the examples that we have shared how important marriage counseling is to the stability of our homes. And many of the things we campaign against, if the homes were stable, we will not even see them. We'll be now focusing on how to improve the health of our uh, population. Furthermore, even if you are not ready to volunteer as a marriage counselor, these principles that we have shared, I hope that when you engage patients in the course of your work that have problems that we have outlined in this uh, two-day webinar, you will at least be able to give them something extra than you were giving them before. So we want to also say that there are several resources we are looking for, pamphlets, uh, leaflets, posters, information on shelters, information on um, human resources like physician volunteers for facilitation of programs, nurses, nursing volunteers, social workers, marriage counselors, lawyers, and so on and so forth. Please, there is a number, Tabita, that you should um, send the information to so that we can come up with a database of these resources that we will circulate to our various health facilities. So on that note, I would like to call on our national coordinator, Dr. Bobola Agbonle, to give us the closing prayer. Thank you all for staying with us till the end. God bless you. Um, our speakers, um, that's Elder Claus of Koba and Dickiness Lizzie. Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you very much. It's been a long, yeah. a long one, but it's been, um, it's, it's essential, it's important.
are you saying the closing prayer, Dr. Agonle? What's happening? We're not hearing you. Uh oh, it appears she, she has gone out. <laughs> Dr. Evo, please help us with the closing prayer. Dr. Abonle has jumped out. Um, thank you so much once again to our speakers, Elder Koba and Dikine Um for the, for the past two weekends, we've had expository lectures on marriage and we, we do know that we'll go out and transmit this knowledge out to our patients. So um, in the name of Jesus, Amen. Father, we thank you even for this time. Thank you for the entrance of your word has brought light to our lives. It has given us even more understanding than we have had. Thank you, Father, for we shall not just be hearers of your word, but we shall be doers. For this, for this whole we have learned today, we shall go we shall out and be light out to the world in the name of Jesus. Father, we Amen. thank you for every marriage represented here. Father, we pray that from what has been learned in the past two weekends, that the marriages will become better. Every family here will be a light to the world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, praise and glory. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you, Lord, for their understanding is increased. Father, thank you for even as they have given of themselves and their knowledge. Father, we ask that you replenish and enrich them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for M1. M1 will only grow higher. M1 will only have more impact. M1 will be a solution, a solution bearer to the world in the name of Jesus. Blessed be in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Zodo Aham Neze. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you. Thank you, our facilitators, Elder Ukoba, Espaya, Deaconess Lizzie. It's been wonderful. We will share the recording. Thank you, Dr. Kofure. I made sure that I got your, your name this time around in the participant list. Thank you, Dr. Igis Kayode Iasere. We appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Mfon. Thank you for joining us after your wedding. Thank you, Professor Belgam, our senior member school coordinator. Thank you, Dr. Nkese Mpanam. Thank you, thank you, Judith Ijoma, Dr. Pene, Dr. Margaret Odili. Thank you, Franca. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been awesome. Have a lovely weekend. Bye. Congratulations, Bye. MP. Thank you, my uh, MP. God bless you. You are yeah. very patient. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Good night. You once Bye. more, Dr. Osegi. Good night, everybody. Uh, Thank Bye. you. Good Bye. night. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, ma. Thank bye. you so much. Bye. God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, MP, ma. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You, MP, for organizing. Thank you, mommy. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Professor Belga. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Have you. Bye. 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 Good weekend.